whether you're a lifelong keeper or just getting started, help us encourage responsible keeping, conservation, and public education in the interest of keeping our reptiles safe and healthy as we protect them for future generations. You're invited to spend time with us as we experience these awesome animals together on Intrepid Exotics. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's good to see you. I've been gone a little while trying to recover from this little eye infection that I got when you wear contact lenses and keep reptiles. They don't always go well together, so it's kind of kept me off camera. Um, without dragging this intro out very long, I um, wanted to introduce you guys to somebody that I've been following for years, well over a decade. Uh, easily one of the most intelligent people that I know. Um, his name is Aaron Ra, and he has a, he studied paleontology at the University of Texas, um, also anthropology at Arizona State, and he has a very good series out that'll be of interest to you guys, uh, specifically on snake evolution, and he's a fellow snake keeper, and I just wanted to invite him on to chat for a little while, so hi, Aaron, good to see you, brother. How you do, sir? Good to be here. Oh, man. So it's been a while. It's been a while. We've had this in the works for a long time, trying to trying to figure out exactly how to go about it. And um, I think we kind of decided to just sit back and chat about stuff and hit questions as they come in and, and roll with the punches. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, my voice is normally a really good baritone. Yeah. Right when the podcast began. My snake has decided that my voice would change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can barely see her. That is the female, yeah. right? Yes, <laughs> this is a this is a, a Dominican red mountain boa, nice. and she has loosened her grip a bit in the last mm -hmm. minute or so. But but it was like right as you started, she like squeeze. I'm like, okay. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's funny because, you know, we all say that, you know, our snakes aren't going to choke us out or whatnot, but even my ball python, she's, she's notorious for that. My adult, she'll wrap around my neck and she just clings on really hard and I can feel it cutting the blood off to my brain. And I'm like, wouldn't it be embarrassing to do all this handling with 16 foot retakes and then be in the paper the next day for getting strangled to death by a five foot ball python. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I did a show with this one on me where she was actually constricting during the show. Nice. And so my voice is affected. My face is inflated. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I've got to start unwrapping. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's six foot eight. Yeah. And then she's skinny bodied. I mean, she's a boa, but she's very skinny bodied. Yeah. I've got one back there that's six foot ten, just two inches longer. Mm-hmm. But he's this big around. <laughs> like a blood python so, body, huh? Well, exactly. So he I've, I've got a BCI back there, just two inches longer than this thing. But their their body plan very different. Right. Yeah. And, and really people keep keep a look at her and they see the the shape of her head and the skinniness of her body. They, and they because she's more she looks more like a viper, mm -hmm. honestly, than she does a boa. Right. Yeah, those are really those are those are fairly rare too. I don't see too many of those around. They're from the island of Hispaniola, you know, it's not a not a not a major snake trade place. Right, right. Yeah, that's like the Sri Lankan that I had uh, gotten off Aubrey Pruitt. I, my understanding mm -hmm. is there's only like twenty of those in the country. So yeah, my my lymph nodes are compressing now. <laughs> <laughs> you you gotta. Ah, uh, I love it. There you go. Loosen, loosen up a bit. Exploring girl. Girl. <laughs> I quite like her, though. Even though she's tried to kill me on camera twice. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's a gorgeous animal. It's, there's just something about those locality boas that's that I've always loved. Hmm. I'm going to say hello uh, to a couple of the people we got here. Christina here, genetics nerd. Uh, Good to see you. Who else we got? We got Mr. Hill. Jim, how you doing? We are, oh, northern Louisiana. Outstanding. And we've got a couple folks that I recognize from earlier today on the podcast that made it out. 
Hey, good to see you. Kagan. This lady right here is an awesome retake handler. That kind of a shame she moved all the way back down to Georgia. But uh, I fought some 18-foot mainlands with her before that, uh, <laughs> that have scared the hell out of a lot of men. <laughs> it's really awesome. Well, so we got for for your channel. Um, I mean, there, we have the 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 Sunny and Share channel, and and, and that just seems like a, yeah, a, a freak occurrence, like a unique uh, situation. It was it was nice to see yours, and the, the 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 thing that I like particularly about yours is you've got a you've got a sixteen foot retic out there, and you when you take the snake out in the grass and just set it in the grass, and then you walk back toward the camera, your back is to the snake. And you're not even watching the snake. You're just talking to the camera. Mm -hmm. Snake seeks you out, mm -hmm. you know, and climbs up on you and everything. And I'm like, okay, he's got a relationship with that snake. That's mm -hmm. very encouraging. Um, you and I, I think, are about the same age. <laughs> yeah. But she's trying to kill me again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was there was a time not that long ago when I when when. When I first became aware of, of retics available in the pet trade in this country, they were almost always wild caught in Thailand and then flown over. Right. And so you couldn't get a hatchling. That's just not available. You, you couldn't mm -hmm. have one. You're going to get something that, that, that was already living in the jungle. And maybe it's only four foot long, but that's about the smallest you could get them. Mm -hmm. And aggressive, you know. So, you know, the, the first retex that I'd ever encountered were like dangerous damn things, even as babies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and and they just had a reputation of being these these things are are, are out to kill you. Right. And it's it's nice to see what what you and and a couple of other people have done in raising these huge, powerful apex predators with a, a level of gentle care. Uh, where the animal always feels secure and never feels scared when they actually feel cared about. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it, it's hard for people to imagine a snake having a need to feel cared about. Mm -hmm. But I remember somebody, and I think it was you actually, who posted something that says that anything that can feel threatened. Yeah. Can feel comfort. Mm -hmm. Like, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that just, I, I didn't even hear that anywhere before. I just, it, it was an argument that people would keep saying is that snakes can't feel anything and reptiles can't feel anything. and Cold-blooded. Yeah, I mean, it just, it stands to reason that if you can, if you can feel fear, you can, the, the absence of fear can be there. And that state is comfort. It's, you know, it's, you know, and these animals aren't afraid all the time in the wild. So, I had the advantage once of having a pet emu. Oh I had yeah, an emu in my I had an emu in my backyard for three years. Awesome. And they're they're not smart animals. <laughs> so I mean, the brain of an emu is smaller than its eyeball. But <laughs> right. the thing is, is it's it's how you raise it, it how it's how consistent you are with it. One of the huge failures that sadly, the, you know, like my generation. And everybody living before that is is largely responsible for, is you know we are the dominant species. We will you know assert our our alpha, and discipline these animals to respect us. Well, that mm. is so not the approach to take <laughs> right. with, with any animal, <laughs> right? Because what you end up with is an animal that doesn't respect you. The animal fears you. Mm -hmm. And because it's fear and not respect, the subtle difference there is that the animal is going to try to find a way around your discipline and it's going to find a way to retaliate. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, if, if all it's ever known is gentle compassion and, and you know, care, mm -hmm. you, you're just not going to get right that same reaction and you sure yeah you you maybe you are dominant but it's just not like the they're, they're not going to understand discipline right you know? and I, unfortunately i was raised by people who thought who actually said something like this to me 
it's just a dumb animal that don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I was with that emu for three years. He and I had a wonderful relationship until we, the city made me put a leash on him. Really? <laughs> it's a ridiculous thing. Right? So I would walk him to the park twice a week. I'm walking a bird that's six foot six. <laughs> I, I walk him to the park. And then he would hit, the, as soon as his feet hit the grass, he would do this weird thing with his head and then take off running for a few seconds. Yeah. 40 miles an hour for just a few seconds. And then after that, he would chill out and we would just saunter about the park for a couple of hours. Okay. And it would be nice. That's cool. Uh, I would have to bring a bicycle to catch up to him <laughs> because there's no way I could catch up to him just running. Right. I wouldn't know where the hell he is if I was just running. So I had to, I have a I have have a bicycle to find him. But we would just spend the day like that and and do this twice a week. And the city finally told me that the, the cops round me up and then say we you have to have a leash on him. I'm like, look at it. How the fuck am I going to put a <laughs> leash on this? But they made me do something like that, and the bird never forgave me for it. Really. I, I tried to put a, a harness on him. It destroyed our relationship. Man, it's sad. The, yeah, the bird had no trust, no respect hmm. at all after that. Me trying to harness him? No. From from then on, uh, whenever I, I could uh, to, to interact with the bird at all, mm -hmm. he'd be doing this thing where he comes up with his, his head like up, up here. Right. To distract me, to make me look up. And then when I look up, he kicks me in the crotch. Oh, damn. <laughs> They've got some yeah. vicious feet. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was all because I'm trying to, because the city made me do this thing. And Man. so with keeping reptiles, it just, you, you, you need to have that consistency because they, like some relationships I've had in the past, they will keep a list <laughs> of everything you've ever done they didn't want you to do. Yeah. And so the next time you do something they didn't want you to do, they will immediately bring up the thing from five years ago that you did. Mm -hmm. That's that. Retics are especially <laughs> notorious for that. I mean, they remember people. They remember people that they don't like. Um, Kagan in the chat here, she can attest to that, too. You know, there was that there was some snakes that we had cared for that. There was some people that just you knew to stay away from that enclosure because that animal didn't like you. Yeah. And I was I was really fortunate with my big male retic because when I got him, that's the way he was with everybody. He was like twelve feet long when I first got him, and he would pop the glass. <clears throat> he would chase how do you, me out. How do you? Of the... This was your first retic? Um, no, no, he wasn't my first retic. But um, when I first got him, okay, um, yeah, yeah, he was he was really really hostile. He chased me out. This was the first time my girlfriend had heard me squeal like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting it. I went into the one side of the enclosure when he was on the other and he came across on me. So I jumped out. And as soon as I jumped out, he chased me out of the enclosure. I mean, he, like six feet of him out of the enclosure coming after me. Really hostile snake. But after a couple months of working with him, I mean, he is the way he is now, you know, just perfectly content yeah. seeking me out and stuff like that which is really awesome my first experience with retakes was one of those foreign-born imported wild caught yeah um, i was i was working <laughs> in a pet store i was in my 20s so uh, and this there was no multicolored. there was no you know banana you know all right. the different types of morphs that they have available now there was none of that there's 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 they didn't even know what the dwarfs were there's, there's just retic, you know? And so we had this one that as I remember, it was four to six feet long. I think it was about six feet, but he's all rolled up. It looks about like this thing at the size. So I'm guessing about six feet and it had gotten out of this, out of its cage. They didn't have enclosures. You know, they put right. that back then. Everybody kept their snake in a fish tank. Remember? Mm. Yeah. Or the closet. You know, there was there was one guy that, that kept a, a fucking BCC in the closet. Right. You didn't want to. So, uh, what's the humidity? Uh, what's the <laughs> what's the temp? Fuck, I don't. It's the closet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's changed since then. 
Well, the, 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 we're not talking about people who were, you know, in, into herping. We're talking about somebody that wants to brag that they have a big snake so they can get ladies. Right. And then just terribly irresponsible. I can't say much because when I was in my 20s, I was terribly irresponsible. I, I once had a Malaysian water monitor <laughs> until it got loose and the police shot it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So that, and I, and I look at it in retrospect now and, and realize that I didn't have the wherewithal to keep something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't really have it now. I mean, you, just you some mean you've, you've got a, you've got a Nile, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just imagine one foot bigger, you know, like mm -hmm. seven foot or 140 pounds, something like that. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and these are man eaters in the wild. Mm -hmm. They really are. And so it's not just a Komodo dragon. You could just as eat. Well, actually Niles too. There, there are cases where Niles have eaten people. I've I've heard I haven't looked into it, but you know people that um, had passed away in their homes or something like that, and then you read about the you know the the free room monitors that they had in there were making a morsel of them after they'd gone. And well, yeah, the, the the story that I saw was that the guy had been bitten and was bleeding profusely because back then they didn't know they were venomous, did they? Right. So so the, you 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 get bit and then you bleed like water. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy couldn't get to his door, couldn't get out. Really? And so they, yeah. Man, that's rough. But go, go ahead with what <laughs> you were saying, though. I'm sorry. Oh, no. No, I don't even. I was, God, I don't even remember. All right. That. So let me jump back to mine. So I, my first <laughs> experience is, is this retic, this six foot retic gets out of its cage. And I'm just going to go collect the snake and put it back. I've been catching snakes since I was a kid. I spent most of my childhood in Arizona, and if, if it's not a rattlesnake, it's not venomous. You know, right. I've never seen a coral snake in my life. But if you, if I had seen a coral snake, those are distinctive enough. I don't think there are milk snakes in Arizona. There's just the, so if you see red in anything, you know, mm -hmm. you see that kind of striking pattern. From. Well, that would even as a child, I would know not to mess with that. But I never saw anything like that. I just got in the, in the habit of just anything that didn't have a rattle on its tail, I can catch. Mm -hmm. So it, it was bad when I moved to Texas and I saw what I thought was a water snake. I'm like, oh, cool. And I go to grab it and then it struck at me and I saw that all white cotton mouth. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, fuck, <laughs> I'm, in a different, I'm in a different place now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually caught a water moccasin as it was crossing the sidewalk in the park down the street. Really? I caught one in my hands and I have it running through my fingers and I'm looking at the patterns on its back. I'm like, what? I've seen this. What is this? <laughs> and I finally pieced together what it was at the precisely <laughs> right moment. When I realized the whole fuck moment about what this is, yeah. I go to sling it off. And that was the same instant that it remembered what it was. <laughs> 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 it's tried to strike me, but my hand is already in fling mode. Oh man! When I saw the mouth open up, and and I'm like, Whoa, no, you're already <laughs> flying backwards, man. <laughs> well, at least well, you managed to have a moment there for a little while. Where I did. Was I did. Disassociated from their identity. <laughs> so I go to. So I'm used to grabbing snakes. You know, just I, I was always good at catching snakes, and I never did that thing that I see all these idiot kids do. When you hold it, you know, seize it by the neck. Yeah. If you want to fight the damn thing, fine. That's but if you don't want to fight, if you want to hold it, let it move through your fingers, let it move around your arm, all that. Uh, and so I, I saw a video of some kid got kid that got uh, bit by a a, uh, a coral snake. Mm -hmm. The kid's holding this thing on video. He's like 10, 11, something. And he's like holding this coral snake and his friends are recording on their phones and like, isn't this a cool snake and all like that? And it's fine. He's holding a fucking coral snake. He thinks it's, right. a, it's a king snake or mill snake or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, and, and it wasn't until he tried to seize it behind the neck yeah. that he got bit right. and discovered, Oh shit, this is an elapid. <laughs> and now what the fuck? But he, of right. course he didn't say elapid cause he was an 11 year old idiot, but <laughs> But how do you get bit? You got bit by seizing the damn thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to catching snakes. I know how to catch snakes. And I go to I go to collect this retake. But as I lean in toward it, he struck at me. And I had a instant flash. 
of when I saw those teeth, when I saw six rows <laughs> of what looked like bent glass nails, like <laughs> every tooth is a fang. <laughs> uh -huh. Like, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> I am, yep. I am not catching that snake. <laughs> there's been there's been times, man, where I've been up on a ladder in enclosures, opening doors eight foot above the ground that's got an 18 foot retake in there that hates humanity. And as soon as the door opens up, so many times, man, all it would be is just a head and mouth and teeth coming right at me, and I'm jumping off this ladder. And going, oh my god, how am I going to get this snake out? Of here? <laughs> and then there was there was there. one where uh, I'm working for this guy, and I was in my 30s now, uh, and, and and my boss realized that he was he's be, he's going to be fired. He's just realized that this just very well might be his last day, and if he loses his job, he's going to have to leave the state. And he had a 10 foot retic, and and remember this is. This was in, this was still in the 20th century, like 1997, something like that. Yeah, when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Make you feel old, does it? We're going to be having walker races pretty soon. <laughs> so the, he had a 13-foot BCC uh, and a 10-foot and retic. And... He 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 says, "Hey, do you, do you want a snake? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna have I'm gonna lose my job. I, I can't keep these snakes. I have to go to a state where they're not even legal. Mm -hmm. He's gonna have to leave them." And he said, "I can give I can just give you the snake. I can give you the enclosure. Everything. You can just have it for free." Nice. And at the time, you remember how expensive retics were back those years ago. Well, I mean, I was back in the day too, where people were spending ten grand for a ball python too. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, this was something, this was well out of my price range, but to get the enclosure and everything with it, and you're just going to give me the snake? And the only problem I had with that, I would have jumped on it because I was the idiot that had a Malaysian water monitor. <laughs> you know, and it went, I didn't even have an enclosure for it. I, I, I had it like locked in a bedroom. And the, But anyway, I, I, I had a, an enclosed back porch that uh that i was keeping it in and what it did when i showed up with its food the aluminum back door was bent it had grabbed the door against the door jam and <laughs> pulled it apart so i come down to the, the bottom yeah. of the door is bent like that i'm a like, holy fuck <laughs> yeah there was a there was a child swimming pool back there there was a big old tree branch for it to climb on i had set it all up it was the right humidity the right temperature and everything it was it, i'd set it all up properly I just I didn't have any idea that it could that it could bend the the door the way that amazing. it is. That it, yeah, it was amazing strength. I should have. I was told not to underestimate it. I did underestimate mm -hmm. it a couple of times. There was a time when it, it it I had it in the bathtub just relaxing, and he come out of the bathtub and he pulled the heater grate off the floor. So this screwed down, but he locks his clothes claws on it, pulls the grate off. And now he's gone down into the heater vents. Oh, man. So fortunately, this is summer, so that's not going to be a problem. But that means that I have to go down to the basement of this house and go pounding onto the different pipes until I can find the one that goes donk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I had, to I had to disassemble the heating system to get the fucking lizard back. <laughs> so this I'm guy offers me this... this this guy offers me a 10 foot retake and I'm all excited about it because I'm stupid, <laughs> but I'm not entirely dim. I did have the problem of having a two year old child in my house at that time. Mm -hmm. And I knew how embarrassing it would be to go, well, well yeah. silly me, the snake <laughs> got out. <laughs> having, to having to explain yes. what happened to the children. <laughs> it's always bad PR. <laughs> exactly. You never expect a python to bring your family anything but joy, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you've seen that skit from The Onion. Um, 
if you have not, so. you have to see that. If you, if you haven't, you have out. to see it. Yeah. <laughs> This could happen to any family with a 20-foot python. You've, you've got to look that up on the onion. I can't believe I'm surprised that you haven't seen it. It's funny as fuck. I'll look that up this afternoon. <laughs> see if I can find it. But yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's a really good point of reference when you're talking with new keepers, man, because you know, you can understand how easy it is to see something and think, oh, man, this is gonna be really cool to have until you actually have it and realize what it actually takes to take care of it and all that, you know. Yeah, and remember uh, when I had my my Malaysian water monitor, which just I thought hands down this is the coolest pet I will ever have. Mm -hmm. It was evil. It was the embodiment of power. <laughs> this was such a beast. When I went to go get it, the people that said they were they were getting rid of it because they they couldn't. Uh, they, they said it would thrash. It had a huge four foot by four foot cage. It was also, I think, three foot high, but it it, it had this cage and it would um, I think it was a cube, four by four by four. But they would they had it covered with a with a sheet or a blanket. And so we have to do that because every time he sees us, he freaks his shit, thrashes about. Man. And so I go to take a look at this thing. When I pull the, the blanket off to look at him, he looks at me, and you know how you know what dragons these things are, right? So he opens his mouth and goes, oh! <laughs> and as his mouth opens up, I can see all the way down into his gut from his open mouth. Like, oh, it's hollow. <laughs> but then I'm seeing the strings of saliva run from the top jaw to the bottom jaw. It's just all these tiny serrated teeth and all that venom dripping. Well, I didn't know it was venom yet. Nobody did. Mm -hmm. There were no scientific tests to confirm that these were venomous reptiles. Right. At the time, the Mexican beaded lizard and the Gila monster, which are effectively the same fucking thing, the, these right. were these were listed as the only venomous lizard. Well, now, now that that, that whole that category is much expanded, mm -hmm. you know, people realize that your beardy is technically venomous now. You know, all the the iguanids are are, are te te technically venomous, but it but the the varanids, not technically, <laughs> they are. They have a hematoxin. And I didn't have studies to tell me that. I'll tell you how I figured it out. I was told not to underestimate it, right? But I'm an idiot. And I did over and over <laughs> again. So I go out to go pick him up. And because I'm standing over him, as I bend my six-foot frame down to go pick him up from the ground, he doesn't like the intimidation. So he did something I didn't know he could do. He stood straight up on his hind legs, <laughs> like Godzilla. He just stands there. Now he's three foot tall. Like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> then he did something else I didn't know he could do. I'm, like, I'm, I'm trying to do the discipline thing. I'm trying to show him that, hey, I'm dominant. You you should yeah. be submissive. To, that does Caesar. not fucking work. Yeah. Caesar <laughs> Milan works with dogs, not lizards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly so like i start doing this with my fingers i'm like the fuck are you gonna do i'm i'm superior to you oh it's so stupid so he did something else i didn't know he could do jump straight up in the air <laughs> and he did he sprang straight up and and i reflexively yanked my hand back and i'm glad that i did he hit my my middle finger with two teeth two teeth made connection and was his jaw snapped shut mm. but he didn't he didn't get a bite right. i just hit two of the teeth as i'm yanking my hand back when he makes that bite right and i'm really glad of that because if he had connected i wouldn't be able to express my opinion right <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, the two teeth that hit me for that fraction of a second that they did i know these these two little cut marks down the middle of my finger we have, i've got a mm. snake body tattoo over the, the scar now but this by the way is the tail to the snake's head that is tattooed on my my wife's ring finger so oh, that cool. when we join our hands yeah we have a complete snake we have a complete boa oh cool she That's loves boas so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i yank my hand back i just got these two teeth that scrape on me and it bled like water for two days even under a pressure bandage I didn't Man. need a scientific study to tell me that that was hematoxin. 
Right. Not when I'm bleeding like that for two days. <laughs> Those are the worst kind of bites to take too. The ones where you, that's the worst bite I've ever taken was pulling away at the same time a male retic was striking at me and I, I'm in full pull and his teeth hit and just slice my hand, all the ribbons. Yeah, I would have been better off to just sit there and let him bite me and then wait for him to let go. Uh, yeah. I have, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I that, my, that one messed me up worse than a 16 footer that actually latched on and held on for a while. I have, as you know, I have one retic, uh, and mm-hmm. he is four months old. So he's a tiny little baby. Yeah. And I, I call him my tiny giant because, because I know what he's going to become. Mm-hmm. But right now he's just this itty bitty little thing. And, and I, I try to make sure that we have a very, very good relationship that we don't ever have a bite situation, not even a, a mistaken feed response. Mm. Again, I learned lessons the hard way. I was feeding my daughter's ball python 20 years ago by dangling a mouse over <laughs> it in my hands. Yep. <laughs> The snake missed the mouse, caught my finger, and it freaked the snake out so bad, the snake wouldn't eat for a month. Because mm-hmm. you know how ball pythons are already persnickety about their about their food, but it, it didn't want to bite me. It was right. entirely by accident. But mm-hmm. now it's all psychologically fucked up over it, and yeah. all. And, and but I learned a lesson out of it. You know, I'm going to go buy tongs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still see people doing that stuff in their videos, trying to hand feed their retics and their berms and things like that. And it's like, guys, come With on. With your hand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My bull snake. My bull snake back there, He uh, his aim wasn't real good. I had long mm-hmm. tongs for a bull snake. Mm-hmm. And he missed the mouse I was feeding him. He shot a foot past the mouse. Mm -hmm. bit my knuckle, wrapped my knuckle in his coils. And I wish I had my camera in hands reach at the moment because I wanted to get a picture of this so bad. I'm like, I've got a foot of tongs or 18 inches of tongs. That's where the mouse is, but this is where the snake is. It's on my knuckle. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. And if I could do this with a, with a snake, that's not even four foot long yet, a 14 foot. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not good. They're not going to miss by a foot. They can miss by four feet. They'll be good. <laughs> my uh, my female retic, when she was maybe six feet long or something, I had to. Dr- I had her in an enclosure with drop down doors, which I don't like anyway. But um, oh yeah, I, I get the, you. Yeah, yeah. I dropped the dropped the doors, hung the rat down there. She missed it, plugged into my chest, and just sat there. I mean, her mouth was all the way open, so all of her teeth just landed right in my chest. So I had to pull her off and put her back in. And as soon as she got her wits about her, she took the rat for me. But, yeah, I'm I'm very, very careful when I'm, like, even as sweet as my male is, man, when I went there down there to feed him today, as soon as he saw me, he just shot a foot closer to me. As soon as he seen me turn the lock, he struck at the glass. As soon as he seen me slide the door back, he struck at the glass again. Because his his food response was just off the chain today. So I wish that we had the advantage of the internet in my youth when I when I didn't have to learn lessons the dumbass way. You know, or where where you have to take a college course. I mean, where where would you learn herpetology in the eighties? Right? I mean, you'd have to take a college course. And they didn't know shit then. Mm -hmm. You know. So it's, it's, it was just trial and error yeah. on how anybody figured anything out at the time. Yeah. And, and I mean, there was so few people that really kept, that really knew what they was doing back then. That Indeed. Like, you were pretty much shit out of luck. I mean, we're really fortunate to have the resources we do now. I've got a couple of false water cobras behind me. Yeah. And I, and I love them. Uh, they're, they're even though they're they're both they're male and female they're the same species but they have very different uh, temperaments. Mm-hmm. So uh, my male, he's six foot two roughly, uh, and he he does he's he's an introvert. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like being out. He he he'll calm down. He won't attack me. He's venomous, and there's not there hasn't been a lot of studies about the venom of these things. Very little is known about the venom of false water covers. But we know that if you handle them well, if you keep them well, they're not 
aggressive usually. I've seen one. I've seen video of one that was super aggressive, and, and all I could do was looking at that thing. The hell did you do to that snake? Right. Because this species doesn't act like that mm. unless they've been abused. But, you know, my snake... I took him out to a, a literal pub crawl because I do that sometimes. And I took I took my uh, my my falsy and he was just not having it. He he doesn't want to be in a public place. He doesn't want to be out. He wants to be left the fuck alone. And so I've come to respect that. I have the female. She's a different thing. She's dangerous. She's a she's a dangerous viper when she's in her cage. But once she's out. It's all good. Hmm. I can take her places and I can just let, I, I took her to my son's house and I just set her down on the table and let her roam. And she did very calmly, very slowly crawling over people and wandering nice. around to inspect things. And it was, this snake has no fear. She's not afraid of anything. She's not intimidated. She's not nervous. She's completely comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's the way I want it. Yeah. And so she enjoys, she enjoys being taken out and, and seeing things and going places. And we go to, we, we'll go to like a beer garden or something. I'll, I'll set her on the table and I'll just let her wander. Mm -hmm. Now she's fast. So I'm, I'm keeping close eye and I'm close by. Right. But she's, but she's not, um, she's not intimidated. Uh, she's intimidating. Mm. <laughs> but she's, I walked yeah. in with my snake wrapped around my neck. To, to, to grab a beer, didn't even think about it. And the, the guy sitting right next to me turns and sees the snake around my neck, about jumped out of his skin. <laughs> and she is venomous. So it's justified, and it was my fault. I, I should have thought this through before walking in there like that. Mm. So, as I said, I learned lessons the hard way. Yeah, I'll, I'll take mine up to the pet shops and stuff like that sometimes. And it's it's always it always starts conversations. I end up, you know, giving classes out in the parking lot before I go half the time, you know, sit and talk with one person. Another person comes up for, you know, you got five or six people out there and, you're, you know, talking to them about snakes. And we took uh, uh, educational stuff too out in parks and stuff. It's really cool. I've seen that. I was that was I was delighted that you could do that. Yeah. Uh, that you brought a what was it? A 16 footer? um to meet a bunch of 18, elementary school children 18 or 20 footer um that was out there with us that day yeah it was really really and, and it didn't eat hardly any of them yeah yeah i mean just enough to get him by for a couple days yeah yeah almost all of those kids <laughs> got know, home you, you gotta feed you gotta feed them all at least three kids a week right <laughs> so amazing some of the things that you hear when people talk about snakes like that <clears throat> uh, how many you know what does that thing eat every day it doesn't eat every day <laughs> my, my male may eat once every three months or something like that Man. yeah i've people got just uh, get my such BCI. a lot of impression about them I, I i i'm having trouble relating to the fact that this snake only needs to eat one rat a month it's mm. just hard for me to I feel like I'm starving him. Mm -hmm. I sort of give, instead of the jumbo rats, I'll give him a smaller rat every two weeks or whatever, just to, yeah, because I, I, I feel like I'm, like I'm neglecting him. Well, how do you feel about maintenance feeding? Um, I, you know, it's, I don't know. I like maintenance feeding and power feeding and all of that. I, I really pay attention to my individual animals and I kind of push all of that other stuff out of my head. Like I said, my male, he's gone six months before without eating. And I used to worry about it um, when I first started working with these guys. But after the first or second time that you offer them a meal and they just stick their nose up at it, and now you just, you know, you just wasted a six, seven pound rabbit. And then you go to offer yeah. them the next week. And it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to wait a month, let you do your thing. And then we'll offer you again. I mean, you know, you know, these guys are, they're, they're evolved to be able to, you know, to go extended periods between meals and stuff. So I, I really don't stress it. Oh. Well, my, the reason I asked the question is because um, I asked, I asked some, uh, a local breeder, 
uh, I was looking at one of his retics and I asked who, how big the, the, the sire was, because I want to know, you know, what, what is my expectation on this one? Right. Uh, and he, and he says, uh, cause I don't, I don't want to pay all the money for a dwarf. You know, I figure if I get a male, it's going to be roughly half the potential size of a, of a female. Right. So mm -hmm. we'll just, we'll just look at getting a male. And so he says the, the father is nine feet. Right. Wow. Okay, well, that's dwarf size at a mainland price. Okay, that's, that's right. <laughs> decent. Until he explains why it's only nine feet. Mm. Because he deliberately does maintenance feeding mm. so that it doesn't get too big. Yeah. And Either, so you're, you're, you're depriving an animal that wants food. Right. And you're not providing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and I tell people too when they ask about ask about what they should be feeding them. You know, it's just like a human being. You know, if a person is genetically predisposed to be six foot tall, mm -hmm. if you only feed it once a week, it's still going to be six foot tall. It's just going to die. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of the same thing with the with the snakes. You know, they're genetically predisposed to their size. And, you know, if you feed them a lot, of course, then they're going to grow a little bit quicker and they're going to get obese quicker, of course, too. But this guy told me that all the local breeders uh, and he was he was pointing at a number of other you know, like uh, relatively big names in the industry in this area. Mm -hmm. He says that they all do that, that they all do maintenance feeding to keep their males as small as possible, which just makes no damn sense to me. And I know I know there are other people who are who are getting into the industry who find out about maintenance feeding and they find out how often these other people are doing this to control mm -hmm. their size to to keep them at dwarf size. And one of the things that doesn't make sense about because like, I I bought them a snake the, as a gift, mm -hmm. and we found out that the reason it was so incredibly undersized was because it had been maintenance fed. This was something the guy admitted to me that the snake should be twice the size that it is at this age. Really? Why the hell is it so tiny? And that's the reason. Because he's he's doing maintenance just just in, which which if anybody doesn't know what the maintenance feeding is, of course it's just it's giving it just enough food to keep it alive, right? But so that it won't thrive, and so they end up being undersized, malnourished. Yeah. And it, it, it when you think about the fact that if you're breeding these snakes. The bigger they are, the more expensive they tend to be. Well, there's there's that that you're you're ignoring, mm -hmm. and in this case, it was a ball python. How big can it fucking get? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's Why would you even pythons? do that? I mean, I can I, I can understand almost if you're afraid of getting a retake, if you're afraid of getting something that's beyond your capacity. Mm -hmm. But still, even then. You know, there's there are some people that what that buy retics because they want big snakes. Mm. So feed it what it's supposed to be fed, and yeah. I don't mean go the other way. I don't you know I, I I equally do not endorse power feeding because I've heard I've I've gone through all the list. You know, have had other people explain to me the, all of the different uh, side effects, mm -hmm. deleterious side effects that can come from power feeding, like the the, the spinal problems and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Feed it what it's supposed to get. Feed, you know, oh, yeah. the, the amount. Of, so. Yeah, it's it's every one of my animals, it seems, is on almost <clears throat> every one of my big animals, I should say. My smaller ones, they'll typically eat once a week with the refusal here and there after shedding or something. But my big animals, you know, my, my, my younger uh, female retic eats significantly more than my older male retic does, even though they're the same size. The female is still growing. You know, they're both 16 feet now, but the male is like 10 years old. And he's, you know, at, at that point in his life where he's not going to grow really quickly, but my female yep. being half that age in the same length is still putting on. Because the size difference the between the male and female is dramatic. Yeah. So I, I try and gauge it just on their metabolism. Every snake. So I've got different. my my tiny giant, as I put it, nice. is a four month old hatchling. He eats twice a week. He eats a, 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 a with uh, my my false water cobras. They have a higher um, metabolism. Mm -hmm. So some of my snakes and my baby snakes and my and my falsies, they eat every Wednesday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so I have my baby retic. He's on that pattern. 
when he reaches four feet, then I will shift him to once a week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I'm not sure when it is, but I'm going to be, you know, cutting larger portions, but less often. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm open for advice because I'm learning this as I go. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, like Aubrey, a friend of mine out here, who's a uh, retic and, and monitor breeder, he religiously does smaller meals weekly. And I yeah. know other people that'll do larger meals less frequently. Um, that is, like I said, with my, with this, with the snake that I've got, the male retic that I've got, I'll give him seven, eight pound meals and he'll go two, three months without eating. And Aubrey will give him. How, how old is he? He's, he's 10 years old or so. Okay. So, and then Aubrey will feed his, you know, four pound pigs weekly, smaller meals there. And I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that there's, there's a better way out of those two. I think it's kind of six in one hand, half dozen in the other type thing. Um, there's probably I'll tell you what I'd like to see. To both. I, I, I had, I had trouble finding what the growth rate is for a male retic, mm -hmm. you know, cause all the growth rate is based on female. And I wanted to know what the what the dietary expectations are, and it was hard. I keep I've got a notepad where I I found little bits of information here or there, and I and I started stockpiling. Should somebody with experience who has raised one from baby too big, uh, especially with the male, because you can't you can't get them distinguished by by sex. I'd like to somebody somebody need you know, come up with a simple chart. We found one for boas. That's that was very helpful. Yeah. But can't find one for, for the retex. For how long should you expect it to be a male at one year? How long would should you expect it to be at two years? Mm -hmm. And what is the feeding regimen average? Yeah. You know, we, I, I've seen one where they say feed it one or two of this general size. This is, you know, deviations as to, as to what the snake wants, however you determine that. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to find that information. Yeah. So I, I'd like a simple chart idiots can follow and just like and, and broadcast that somewhere that's easy to find. Yeah, that may be a good thing to maybe a good thing to put out there and start getting some input from some of some of my breeder friends. Exactly. <clears throat> yes. Get, collect collect all of their suggestions on that stuff and then kind of shuffle it together into what the common consensus is on. That tell me more. Project. Tell me more about how you how you get such a big damn dangerous animal to, to, to interact with you the way that yours do. Um, you know, there, I love I, the relationship that you yeah. have with yours. That's, that's just ideal. Yeah, it, it is. They, um, there's you know a lot of it has to do with, with just like you were saying um if, if a snake if you have a bite from one of your snakes it's just as bad if not worse for them probably worse for them than it is for us you know because we understand what happened you know the snake doesn't all they know is that you know they've been a human now they've got a problem and and it stresses them out and so forth and so I, I just really, I, I, um, it's, it's that balance between confidence and caution with them and never thinking they're going to bite you, but always knowing that it can happen. I don't know. It's just, it's just a weird balance where you've got to be able to trust them implicitly, but at the same time be so on point and watching their behavior so that you can avoid having any kind of bad interactions with them. And, and over the years of doing that, and, and you just start to build that trust with them. And I think once you build that trust with them, with mine, I trust them implicitly. Um, once I break the food response on either one of my bigger e-ticks, I never worry about them. I, it That's, never even crosses my mind that they would, with, with they, my, they would possibly bite me. With my falsies? It, they're, they're, there's a switch that flips in them how they are in their enclosure versus how they are when they're out. Mm -hmm. You know, they're dangerous in there. Mm -hmm. Outside, they can be completely chill. It's like when I take my female out, it's like they're just 
instant. Oh, okay. This is what we're doing. This is handle time. Well, I'm going right. to go places. I'm going to see things. And it's a whole different attitude, but inside. Mm -hmm. Whoa, she's dangerous. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was looking at her. She's, she's basking in her bathtub all the way on one side of the enclosure. And I, I reach to the other side of it's a four foot enclosure and she's a baby snake. She just turned one year old. Yeah. So this is a couple yeah, she was, she was three and a half feet long at this point, but she's all the way on the other side of a four foot enclosure. And I reach in to just to stick a, uh, uh, humidity gauge mm -hmm. on our wall. And I look at her and I reach in and stick this and I see the motion out of the corner of my eye as she's rocketing toward me. <laughs> and I, I yanked my hand back and she fired out of the enclosure and now half of her body length is now hanging out of the enclosure because she missed the strike on getting my hand. Uh -huh. <laughs> but because, so that's how dangerous she is. She was going to mm -hmm. hit, she oh, hits yeah. the glass. When I walk by, she strikes the glass and smashes her face against it so hard. I think she's mm -hmm. going to hurt herself because she has that really, really, really strong feed response. Right. Inside the enclosure, fucking dangerous. Mm -hmm. But once she's out and then when she's struck and she missed me, well, now that half of her body is out of the enclosure, I don't even need gloves or a hook anymore. Mm -hmm. She's halfway out. She's cool now. <laughs> It's crazy how different their personalities can be, man. Even even Tigger, my big male retake, he's a, he's kind of a homebody. Uh, it takes some coaxing sometimes to get him to get him out. You know, sometimes I'll open up the door and he'll just fall right out on his own. But other times he'll s up on me. I've had times where he kind of open his mouth just enough to say, you know, leave me alone or we're gonna fight. But it doesn't take but a little bit of tap with the hook, and he starts, you know, turning around, and, and I start to pull him out. But I mean, he was the yeah, same my, way, just throwing it to glass and stuff like that. My my wife and I argued for a year on on me getting a, a retake. She did yeah. not want me to have, <laughs> and I I understand why. And when when we would go to herp conventions, which we do often, you know, when we would see. There was always somebody offering me a baby retic that were always super damn gorgeous. Yeah. You know, and, and really cheap, just so damn beautiful and so affordable. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh man, I I want this. But she's like, okay, and it's a female. <laughs> so 20 foot minimum. <laughs> yeah, 16 foot minimum. <laughs> make, it, make it lucky and it might only stay 16 18 feet after 10 years and she would say we have cats <laughs> and our cats are stupid <laughs> yeah that's, that's but yeah i yeah we've got a miniature pincher that's smaller than tigger's meals so and she lives upstairs and a snake lives downstairs and all's right with the world yeah, um, and when when uh, when my, my snake when my when my retic gets eight feet or so, he will be living in a different part of the house. He'll, he'll, he'll he will probably be in the garage. Yeah. So that we don't. So that I never want to have that moment mm -hmm. when you know that, honey. I think I found the cat. No, you're looking at a snake that's gotten fat in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you go to clean out the snake cage, and there's a collar in it. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> yeah really bad. so i was i was i was talking with this one dealer and, and he had offered me this snake well the people that sold me my, my male false water cobra they that they had these baby retics and the, the, the ladies are like she hands me the most beautiful retic i've ever seen and it's all in you know how they're usually brown well this is green yeah. So this is all, all, it's way on the green scale. And I'm like, oh my God, this is magnificent. Mm -hmm. Green and yellow and everything. And just have just fu so fucking pretty. And she said, I'll give it to you for a hundred bucks. Man. And I turned to my wife and it was female. Mm -hmm. So I got no, I got no argument I can make to my wife. <laughs> just, this is, this is not going to cap out at nine feet. This is going to be 16. This is going to mm -hmm. <laughs> At a minimum, uh, and and, and yeah. 
I met the guy again several months later, and he says, "You know, this it's funny that you 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 turned those down because those were the sweetest babies we ever had. They're mm -hmm. wonderfully hand tamed. They're genuinely sweet. Damn it, mm -hmm. they are. As as long as you as long as you keep an eye on the food response, man, they can be. It's such a catch twenty two when I'm when I'm making videos and and talking about retics because they are intelligent and they just." it's it's a hundred percent on how they're raised you know they can either be any, the sweetest easiest animal in the world or they can kill you anybody that's done any research into keeping a retic anything that you've looked up on youtube you have seen this video where the woman opens a top opening cage yeah and it periscopes mm -hmm. and she says oh you want to come out yeah now <laughs> if, if, before i knew dick about this that's what i would have thought too but mm -hmm. now that i've studied enough about the body language i look at that video i'm like there's everything wrong here oh yeah yeah, yeah. When, and that woman got wrapped got bit got wrapped that snake is trying to eat her it mm -hmm. can't but it's going to kill her before it can figure out that it can't eat her right and so i'm like everybody's seen that video not so many people have seen you know the little bitty girl with sunny and Cher right at 16 feet i mean and we've all seen the horror stories we've all seen pictures of of uh, of human bodies being taken outside of mm. of, uh, of captured retakes and that sort of thing right so, i understand why my wife my tiny little half vietnamese wife does not want to have a fucking reticulated python <laughs> you know and she doesn't have to I, and i don't ever want an in a situation that i have to apologize for right ever so i'm i'm going to avoid any opportunity for there to be mm -hmm. i'm no I'm, I'm never gonna have to apologize for this so at eight foot my retic will be in the garage there won't be yep. any cats <laughs> if it gets out there won't be any cats uh at that size I won't handle it without somebody watching. Mm. You know, at that size, my wife won't handle it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ruth, I, Ruth, is, Ruth is about five foot. She, she's really small, too. So she'll go down when I'm cleaning with these guys. And uh, I mean, she's she's not afraid to interact like like Monty, my female. Um, I'll have the tub sitting next to the enclosure and I'll guide her into the tub and then she'll start scoping around and periscoping all over the place and ruth will you know get a hold of this snake and before you know it the snake's out six seven ten feet she's oh i can't pick her up <laughs> <laughs> and monty's the sweetest snake in the world you know no malice yeah. in that snake at all but it's just heavy yeah you know so i i fully understand my my wife's justified yeah apprehension because we've seen the horror story videos mm -hmm. you know we're, we're we're we saw we saw the uh the onion video that you haven't seen you've got to go see that by the way it's just it's just too funny yeah i'll definitely go check that out <laughs> we, we've seen all this stuff and and it, it it's hard for us to watch the sunny and share stuff i'm like why the hell does that snake just not eat that kid mm -hmm. you know yeah, Ed Ed has done a really great job with those animals. He's done a really great job of training his kids too. Um, and I think she's like 11, 12 years old like that or something now. Mm -hmm. And you know, those kids are already really competent handlers because of that. Yeah. I've noticed watching a lot of the uh, cuz you know, we we're, we're Americans. He you know, Ed is uh, in the UK. Well, you know, we yeah. we live in the US of idiocy. Uh, <laughs> we 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 live in an idiocracy. Right. And I've seen a, a lot of these snake handlers, you know, where they're dancing around with their rattlesnakes and everything. And they're to, everything they do in handling the snake is wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet it takes 20 minutes for the, one of these things to, to launch and bite. Yeah. Because, it, because they were raised in captivity. It would be possible to carry one of these things to keep it and maybe never get bit. Mm hmm. But when you do all of the background noise, all of the vibrations from the music, and you're undulating and dancing, just being a dick, 
mm. with the snake. It's no surprise. You no, no. Realistically, there's always a chance that even if you raise the snake by hand, there's always a chance that one day it's going to be slightly nervous for whatever reason mm -hmm. and tag you. Right. Even 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 the best the best handler you could be, it could still happen that way. Mm -hmm. I remember this uh, this one story that I saw that this woman had a gaboon viper. Mm. And she picked it up by hand. This is a gaboon viper. These things terrify me. She picked it up by hand, set it on the sofa to go clean its enclosure. Now, while she's working on that, it crawled under the sofa. Mm. So she just plunged her hand under the sofa to grab it by hand and pull it out. Hmm. I can understand if you've handled your snake, even a deadly viper, if you've handled it enough times, mm -hmm. you would think that it would be safe to do so. But in this situation where she just blindly reaches into a dark place, that you know, that snake, might be that might be the same lady I remembered seeing um not long ago, the lady that had taken the gaboon viper into the elementary school. And was just free handling the snake 10 feet away from all the kids. And, you know, of course, as soon as that video came out, everybody was losing our minds about it. Like, what is wrong with this lady? But I guess they're known for um, um, removing the venom glands in all their animals before they uh, before they start handling them like that. So that was one of the animals that had their venom glands removed. I guess they do that with all of them. They got cobras and rattlesnakes and gaboon vipers that they surgically remove those from. So I mean, that might have been one of them. I don't. I don't. I don't know what to say about that. I don't. I, mean, I would have thought that that doing it's, that it's ruthless. Like, you see, Kevin McCurley had talked about it. He had adopted a snake, I think, at one point. Um, that it had. I think it was a cobra that um, somebody had removed the venom glands from. So I mean, they could free handle the snake but i guess it's a really stressful procedure on the animal um i guess it's really really tough on i can them. only imagine yeah no, i've seen a number of, of, of videos of people to go out in the wild and they're herping so you know that you know the wild snake certainly hasn't had any kind of surgery done on it but right. there's some snakes that are just not they're just not aggressive well so, coral snakes are one of those it's my understanding that it they, you're more likely to not get one if you pick one up because they're not really inclined to bite. I, I saw that video of the 11-year-old kid. He's holding the snake for like five minutes mm -hmm. before, it, before it bit him. And the only reason it bit him is because he tried to lock it up around behind the head. That's, you, That's right. It's your fault. That yeah. coral snake would have never bit that kid. That kid could have just put it down mm -hmm. and be able to brag about what he did if he had sense enough to know what right. he did. But I've I've seen uh, there's a, there's a couple of snakes from from Thailand where the retics are from. Uh, it, it, this I find interesting. There's one called a red-headed crate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely gorgeous snake. Super fucking deadly. It isn't a lapid. It's not a big snake. It's a very small snake. But it's uh, it has a red head and a red tail and a midnight blue body. I think mm -hmm. with a with a fluorescent blue pinstripe on it. Interestingly. Right. There's a very different species that has an overlapping range. So if you saw one, you would think you were looking at the other one. It's called a Malayan blue coral. Mm -hmm. Stunningly beautiful. Same kind of color configuration. The difference being these are different species. They can't interbreed, but and, and they have a very different venom. So one of them has being neuro, being uh, an elapid, they both have neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. But the other one, the Malayan blue coral, has a neurotoxin with cytotoxin. Really? And the venom glands are enormous. Hmm. They're like a third of the snake's body length. Just really huge. Ridiculous, for, especially for such a small snake. Hmm. It's not aggressive. So I've seen people, I've seen people hold it freehand in their naked hand, no glove. And it's an itty bitty snake. I mean, it, it um, garter snake size. You know, like max three foot, it's, it, it, something like that. The biggest they'll ever get, and so these and and everyone I've seen has been smaller than that. Mm. These people will freehand it. They're, they're not trying to seize it in position. They're just letting it right. run through their fingers or whatever. And and, and then you see these pictures. I'm like, 
I, I want to say, do you have any idea what you have? <laughs> the hell are you doing? So I saw this one video, this, this, uh, 20 year old idiot kid like myself when I was that age, right? He catch, he catches a, a Malayan glue coral and he's holding it for a bit and he's admiring it because the snake is not aggressive. It's not striking at him. It's a mm -hmm. wild snake. You've just picked up a wild snake off the ground. How calm and collected do you think the snake can be? Mm -hmm. But he's, he's treating it like it's something that he's raised from baby. Hmm. And he's like, and, and he's playing with it, playing on it, and playing. It. And finally, finally, it he gets a little too cocky, and it tags him in the finger. Hmm. Does not envenomate. Really, just hits man. him with the thing. His finger swole up to like three times the size of a normal size finger, but that's it. Hmm. If he had actually been envenomated. Because of the cytotoxin, because it, it causes body-wide muscle convulsions until the point that the heart seizes. Mm -hmm. If this kid had been envenomated, the death would have been very... You know how a lapids, when, when a lapid bites you, you could you, you may think you're fine right. until you finally drop dead tomorrow. It's just weird how the how the neurotoxin works. I, I remember seeing this thing, a guy got bit by a cobra. And he's several hours later bragging about it in a bar when suddenly his heart shut down. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, but it, with the, the cytotoxin, it's not that way. You know, 20 minutes or so after the bite, oh, yeah. and suddenly you, you've got violent convulsions. And then your, your heart and lungs both shut down. There's just all like right. all muscle, everything, every muscle in your body is in a spasm, including your heart. And there you're dead. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's agonizing. So this kid, this 22-year-old idiot, gets to brag that he got bit by a Malayan blue coral and walked away because it was no venom. It was good. Learn that lesson. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, even, even, even Chandler got tagged not too long ago um, playing with a cobra. Messing. I don't know if you'd seen it or not, Chandler. Is that the long-haired kid that, that yeah. uh, he, he was in Thailand and he's holding one by the tail? Um, and it nailed his finger. Yeah. I, I thought, mean, yeah, I thought was... this is a kid that did not learn the lesson because here he is in a hospital bed saying you know, he's got his arm in a tourniquet because he's trying to stop the neurotoxin yeah. from shutting down his functions. Mm -hmm. And he's he's still on camera. He's still on his channel performing. And he mm -hmm. says he's learned this lesson. But then in the next scene, when he's out of the hospital again, he's st his finger's still in a bandage. <laughs> he's holding the cobra by the tail again. <laughs> Right, and he, and he's just he's, he's saying he's going to let it go. Well, where was the cobra this whole time? I don't know, but it, he's still yeah. holding it by the tail, the well, he, same he, way he was. Yeah, when he got bit, he keeps his own, and and he's he's been a hot handler for a long time, but um, he just got a little bit too cocky out there with the wild snakes, man, and it got a hold of him. It was probably a dry bite too, um, because you know, I, as far as I know, he didn't have any adverse effects. He went in, got uh. Yeah, any I, I, I agree with you. I, I can't imagine that that, that a yeah. tourniquet, real a tourniquet, yeah, is really yeah, going to stop. Prob it's probably a dry bite. But I mean, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't but, what six months or a year ago or something like that. That was moving a croc out of a captive croc in Florida, and he just goes wading off into the pond, and the thing gets a hold of his leg. He's in a wheelchair for a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. it's like uh, i mean i guess that's one way to get clicks but i'd rather do it without all the teeth in me if i could avoid it <laughs> yeah uh, i mean I, I i can appreciate having battle scars you can brag about all right yeah. <laughs> i don't want any more battle scars but i don't but, want to be disfigured at the same yeah. time <laughs> yeah the uh having the nile monitor hanging off of the back of my neck was enough Ooh. Oh yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think I've got I do have I've got pictures of it here. I was just flipping through all of my stuff. See if I can find it. <laughs> this is really right. freaking funny. Uh let me let me while you're doing that, I'm gonna try to address your chat. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, because I know you're gonna be otherwise occupied. I was gonna I was gonna go put her back and maybe pull out my tiny giant. Let's see. And that was not a euphemism. I am talking about a snake. Right. 
<laughs> uh, and I don't see anybody that was commenting that I that I needed to answer. It's been a while since I saw something like that. I noticed that I have a fan or two in your audience, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, people saying that they, they love, love Sonny and Cher. I like that the, the guy says it as much as, as important it was it was to train the snakes, it was more important to train the child. I, I think that most of the issues that we have, wow, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, he didn't move at all. He just latched on and just clamped right onto my spine. Did you find it was about 20 minutes before it let go? Um, no, with him, it was about three or four minutes. Because he was in an awkward position. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I, I, my, my Malaysian, he, he bit, he, I think he, he I, I had a leather keychain. And for whatever reason, he bit the keychain. <laughs> and I ended, up, I ended up having to drive somewhere with him hanging off my keys and draped over the passenger seat. Because right. he wouldn't let go. I had to go with him. <laughs> Hang on, I, I tell you, man, they will. They are just freaking bulldogs. They they will not let go sometimes, which makes me. I mean, I'm still I'm still nervous sometimes. I was just sitting there the other day on the stump next to his tub, and he started with the long tongue mm -hmm. flicks and crawling up my arm and all that. And uh, I just started to get nervous and started kind of guiding him back over. Because I was waiting for him to, I was waiting for him to bite me again. Give me a moment. I'm going to pass her. She's being really nice, but I'm going to pass her over to my wife for just a moment. There we go. All right. She's really sweet. Yeah. Let's see what else I'm missing here. I know we haven't been paying too much attention to the chat. If you guys have got a, uh, if you guys have got a specific question, go ahead and make sure you're throwing it out there and drawing attention to All right. it. While you're running that, I'll be right back. Okay. Cool. Here. Let's see what we got. <laughs> I see Linda came in from Canada. Let's see, uh, yeah, he was talking about the Anna Venom. <clears throat> yeah, it's amazing how uh, how many people keep venomous here in the states that don't also keep the Anna Venom for the snake, which I just cannot imagine. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I don't keep hots right now is because I can't afford to keep the antivenom on hand. And if I'm going to have something like a Cobra or a, or a Gaboon or something like that, when it's time for me to go to the hospital, I'm showing up with the antivenom in hand because I don't really don't want to die. Not like that. I figure I made it through two wars without dying. I certainly don't want to die from a snake bite. Yeah, I think I would. I, I, I don't mind so much uh, dying as a martyr for the cause. Pretty exactly, you know. Go out and go out in a blaze of glory, you know, military funeral and whatnot. But to have all your yeah. friends go, yeah, that dumbass finally got killed by one of his snakes. <laughs> I don't know that that's. <laughs> I don't know that that's the legacy that I want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this, as you can see, this yep, uh, of all the snakes that we have. This is the only one that's suitable to wear this name. Now, I realize he's not going to be anything compared to your snake. Probably as big as he's not going to be uh, comparable to your snakes. But for my collection, this is Jormungandr. Nice. Yeah. They're such a... I, 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 I'm just... I, I will never... Retakes are always my favorite, man. They, are, they always have been. Yeah, just, I, I love them about their brain. Tell me this. This would be a good question for you. I've, I've heard over and over again that, that retics are the smartest of all snakes. How do they determine that? I'm sorry. I, well, the way I, I notice the difference, and I, I kind of, when I'm interacting with animals, I see a lot of the snakes, some of them, like some of the, and Christina's probably going to come over here and smack me in the back of the head for saying this again, because she always does, because I talk about colubrids sometimes. But sometimes colubrids are just really reactive and almost act insect-like, you know? 
they're not, it's like, they're not processing what's going on. They're just reacting to stuff. Um, the same way an insect would, um, but the larger constrictors, you can actually see their mind working, you know, um, it, it's weird. You know, like when I go downstairs, um, and it's hard to really differentiate now because I've got such a good relationship with all of my snakes that I'll sit down there and then most of them, their heads will pop up and come at the glass and start looking at me. But my retics are the most reactive, my retics and my berms. Um, like my berm too, as soon as I walk up to his enclosure, his nose is at the glass and he follows I've heard good me. things about Burmese. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're really similar to retics um, in a lot of ways. But there's there's just something about working with the retics, man. You, you can tell there's somebody home there. And you just you look in their eyes and you interact with them and you can tell that there's there's some kind of a process going on. But I don't know that there's actually any kind of a, a matrix that they've studied that that will actually show any kind of demonstrated intellect with them or anything. Maybe it's just how when people train. Mm -hmm. you know because the smarter something is the easier it is to train right mm -hmm. and maybe it's just because we take them more seriously because they get that big and we put that much more effort into making sure that we're friends with them yeah and i i, I do try to do that with with all of my snakes i have a bull snake that is it, it's written into his genetic code that he's going to be an asshole that yeah. he's going to be uh he's going to puff up and be threatening and hiss and and act like you know um, Oscar the Grouch, yeah, because he's programmed to mimic rattlesnakes, and so that's mm -hmm. just how he's going to behave. And I've just, I've come to to grips with this that I can only hold him for a few minutes before he starts hissing randomly. Right. Uh, but I, I I still try to maintain a good relationship with him as I do with everything that I handle. Mm -hmm. And but of course there's a there's an impetus that you have to do that with a retic. Yeah, they you've you've got to spend the time. And, and the funny thing is, is like my male, like I said, he's a bit of a homebody, so I don't interact with him a lot all the time. You know, maybe every couple weeks or something. Sometimes more in the summertime if we're going outside and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I, I respect his space, and he likes to just stay curled up and chilled out most of the time. And I do the uh, I kind of caught a little bit of heat about the forest handling with the Sri Lankan. Um, people were talking about the choice based handling, but I, I typically do kind of a choice based handling thing with my retics now. You know, they're well socialized and, and I don't have to worry about them. So if I open up the door and they come out and want to interact, then, you know, I let them come out and play. Um, if I that's so up, far has been, yeah, that's that so far has been my experience with him he, yeah. he usually periscopes mm -hmm. and and wants to come out tell me what what are my expectations on average for a male at one year old a male at fed one? properly yeah because he's only four months right now i could see him maybe putting on a foot maybe something like that he was 34 inches when i got him at six weeks old yeah and he is still he's 37 to 39 now yeah i read that they can put on five feet in a year yeah i mean if he's got another you say he's what four months old he's got another yeah, yeah. so i mean another eight months worth of growth as a man i don't know I mean, he's he's eating eating pretty heavy. I can see him. Putting yeah, he's getting a he he eight, takes two. a a rat pup twice a week, and right. well, actually, the last couple of times he's he's eaten two of them because mm -hmm. I, I feed him one, and he's he's still cruising the glass. He wants that second one. Right. Yeah, he'll. And like I said too, I mean, when I got my male, when I got him, he was about twelve feet long, and six years old at the time i think so mm -hmm. so he the males males you still got you know ways to go with them before they start getting 
fairly big. My female, she shot up on me really quick, though. Yeah, of course, of a couple years, yeah, she was at 12, 14 feet. Yeah, my uh, my female false water cobra, uh, I got her at, again, six to eight weeks old. And she was she's just a palm of my hand kind of thing. Yeah. And she's four foot now at a year old. And they told me she would grow fast. Mm -hmm. So I'm expecting that by the time she's two, that... Uh, that she'll be closer to eight. Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. find here real quick. I've got a I've got a picture of my female sitting on my uh, here we go. I'm pretty close to it right here. Let's see. I like to get him accustomed to socialization. Like we take him to public places and we went to this one beer garden where like everybody on staff just had to come out and hold him for a bit. Yeah. And that was yeah. fun. People and people are really really fascinated by a man when we when we get him out in public and stuff. All right. I found a cool picture here on Monty. It'll show the growth. I'm trying to find the uh what date this was. All right. Let's see. What if I create it? That can't be right. I guess it is. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not it. Damn it. Okay. Close this out. As soon as I figure out how to work all of this stuff, then. <laughs> I often make the joke about old men and technology. Right? <laughs> there we go. That's the picture that I was looking for. So that's Monty. That's my 16 foot female. Okay. And that was taken September 24th, 2021. <laughs> that's, that's what, around six foot right there? Roughly, I'd say. Six, seven foot maybe. Okay. Yeah. So put on 10, 10 feet in two years? Yeah. It's so crazy to see her like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, now <laughs> I'd have to pull up one of my recent videos with her to kind of do a side by side comparison. But she's such a sweet girl. Yeah, so far, he he and I have had we've never that there's never been a, a feed response that was you know mis aimed or whatever there, there hasn't right. been a single negative moment yeah that he, he never musked me none of that well no there was one time when he did musk but i wasn't sure i'm not sure that it was a musking or if it was just he was expelling right because my female would do that she would she would drop her bowels on me for the first year that i had her man i'd be sitting at the desk or something next thing i know she's <clears throat> I only let her run loose on the bed one time before I learned my lesson on that. It's like, no, no more bedroom <laughs> for you. <laughs> but that's such a happy snake right there, man. And I mean, that's, that's going to be his demeanor throughout his life. I'm sure. That's encouraging. Yeah. My, my wife has said many times, I hope he stays this way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only snakes I've ever, the only retics I've ever really seen that were tough to handle, man, were the ones that were mistreated. Um, the ones that weren't socialized right and stuff like that. Any any of my friends' snakes, um, any of their retics, I can go in, take them out, handle them, never worry about getting bit. And just, like I said, there's something about retics, man, and it, once you once you form that connection with them, you're good. And I saw somebody's video where they said, you know, they, they were showing three guys holding three different uh, mainland morphs, uh, or what do you, what do you call them? Varieties. Yeah. Uh, and and one of them was bleeding quite a lot from his hand, and he said, "Well, he just got bit because when you handle a retake, it's not you know if you're going to get bit, but when." <laughs> and uh, I don't like that stereotype. That's that's right. That's what I heard ever since I heard of retics. That's all I've been hearing. Yeah. So I want to, I want to counter that. 
Yeah, like I said, man, as as bad of an experience as it was in that one breeding facility that I was at, um, the good part of it was was like I said, it was just <clears throat> interacting. Tell me a little bit more about that. I didn't I didn't know anything about that. Well, it just so happened not long after I had gotten into reptiles, well, a couple of years after I'd gotten into reptiles, rather, um, I found out that there was a retake breeding facility within 30 minutes of where I lived. And I was like, damn, you know, and I'd seen where they was looking for help. So I went out and I quit the job that I was at making three times as much money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was doing really well at the job that I was at left on good terms there, but I was like, Hey man, I'm going to go work with snakes. Cause that's what I want to do. And went out there and was responsible for um, caring for about 300 adult reticulated pythons in this breeding facility. And we had average length was probably 14 feet all the way up to 22 feet and over 200 pounds. Um, and like I said, it was over 300 of them in this building that was caring for um, a ton of work. Um, but uh, but it was really cool because it was just thousands of interactions with these snakes in all different stages. You know, some of them were really well socialized. Um, some of them were perfectly content being around people. Other ones were, there was some wild cots. There was some ones that had been mistreated that just hated people. Um, so you run a whole gambit of interacting with them. And in an environment like that, yeah, you're going to get tagged. I, sooner or later, it's going to happen. It's just, you, you can't get lucky enough <laughs> to not, um, to not get, you know, make a mistake with one of them. I made a couple of mistakes um, and got tagged, wrapped up a couple of times by some pretty big animals. But uh, now, what is that uh, like? Say again. What is that like to get wrapped up? Um, it's not as bad as you think, really. <laughs> and it's, I guess it's easier to say on this side of it, but the worst bite I ever took was a food response bite from a 16 foot retic. And, um, what I would do sometimes is I'd open up the doors and if the snake was trying to get out, I just put the palm of my hand up and kind of bump its nose with my hand and it'd turn around and go back in the enclosure. Well, this one snake came out, she got out maybe a foot, which was way too far to be doing this. And I just put my hand up there to bump her nose and she'd turn around and got a hold of it and just wrapped me up. Instantly had coils around my arm, up over my shoulders and stuff like that. And, and it was, um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, it wasn't as bad. It hurt. You know, you could feel those teeth just kind of sinking in there, but you hold their head and you keep them from shredding you. You keep them from turning and things like that. And you just wait for whoever's in there with you to start unwrapping the coils. Um, and then once you get those coils off of you, it's not too terribly hard to get them to release. Um, I, I saw this one story about a guy who got wrapped by his retic. He did have somebody there observing, mm -hmm. but the retic was huge. Mm -hmm. And his assistant was unable to unwrap the snake. Mm -hmm. The snake was stronger than the assistant. And so the guy resorted to a knife, a large mm -hmm. kitchen knife, started That's chopping sad. into the snake. Yeah, yeah, he had to start chopping into the snake in order to free the guy. Yeah. So the guy had lost consciousness. He was virtually dead mm -hmm. when they when they peeled him off, and they were they were able to revive him. And of course, the snake died. Uh, mm -hmm. And the guy, when he came back to consciousness and he relives the memory, he said that the, the pain was excruciating. Yeah. Really? It must have been a massive snake because this was this was a fairly good snake that had me wrapped up and it wasn't it was the, the the constriction wasn't painful. Yeah, it was just the just the teeth there. Well, and even it's my a your mileage may vary situation. I think so. I think yeah. so. I it it could have been, you know, where the, the snake may have there's technique too. Um when you're working with a really strong muscular animal like that. You can't muscle with them. You know, there's techniques to working with them. And just like, just like in martial arts, there's, there's certain ways that you've got to go about putting an arm bar or wrist lock on, or they don't work. 
Um, so it's kind of the same thing in working with snakes. You know, there's techniques for getting in there and getting them to unwrap that um, if you don't know them, it, that was one of the things about the lady that got wrapped up out of the fish tank that had that guy trying to help her. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I may, may actually do a video of that and put it on my Patreon. Um, kind of like a, a walk through, talk through with that thing. Because yeah. the person kudos for her for maintaining her cool. Oh in yeah. That situation. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, she did, she did everything right once she got wrapped up, but the person that was there with her didn't have the first clue how to manage that, you know, and then they get in and they start trying to pry the snake's mouth off and stuff like that. And if she would have had a competent helper there that she would have taught how to manage that, <clears throat> they would have just been able to get that snake uncoiled. And a lot of times too, once you get them unwrapped, and you get them to the point where you can kind of stretch them out and get them on the ground, a lot of times they'll release on their own because they feel vulnerable at that point and no longer want to eat, you know? That that mm -hmm. way it turns in a, a defensive situation for them. But uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if Kagan's still in here or not, but um, yeah, her, her and I have pulled snakes off of each other before. <laughs> 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 yeah, she, she she's like a... Uh, a really thin, petite lady, and uh, I've seen her wrestle around some retics now. So, somebody says, uh, uh, "What is it, Jen? Yeah, whoever Jen Three Ticks Nerd uh, says it, dude, nerd. gonna yeah, gonna go work on a enclosure. Oh, yeah. I I am gonna be building a, a stack of five. Six oh, cool. foot by um, six foot by two foot by sixteen inch enclosures. That I'm, I'm about to build because I have a number of things that uh, need. It's time for them to grow out of their their four foot things. What did I do? I was in here trying to type goodbye to Christina here, and my whole screen <laughs> changed all of a sudden. I was like, "Damn, what I break." <laughs> we'll see you, Christina. I'll shoot you a text later. Take my take my ass chewing for talking about colubrids. <laughs> All right. I'm, well, we can talk about colubrids too. Let me let me put him back. I'll be right back. All righty. I love my colubrids. My uh, my Florida king snake is really good. Just really, really hyper and really, really, really reactive. Yeah, Christina, for those of you guys that don't know a genetics nerd, they've just gotten a new uh, new enclosure in from a local guy out here, uh, Chris Salisbury with Gorgon's Head. Um, I can't wait to see what it looks like finished up. It's like an 8 by 4 by 4 I think. Um, just an amazing enclosure. Look through some of these and see if there's... Ah, somebody BH. Got a toke. I had a couple togays. I adopted them out because they hated me. And I could never get them to like me. So, <laughs> so I actually adopted them out to a zoo. They were both just, they would bark every time they saw me. Every time I'd reach in, they'd try and get me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, retics. Ret a, a well socialized retic is going to do one of two things. It's either going to be really high energy and want to run all over the place until they relax, or they're just going to sit there and be chill. Very, very rarely do you see one that's been captive bred. It's going to be antagonistic. They get they get a much worse rap than they should. And retics they can be such easy to work with animals. Even my big even my bigger snakes, man. Um, I'll take them out to do cleanings and stuff like that. And yeah, they're heavy, which makes them a little tough to manage. But you know, as a general rule, they pretty much go right along with whatever I want them to do. And then they'll turn around and try and take off the other direction. You got to chase them down and keep chasing them down until they finally get tired. But it's 
<laughs> I was gonna I was gonna pull out my my uh, false water cobra, but she's locked herself up in her log, so she didn't want to come out and play right now. Yeah, I'll just I'll just let her be. I had her out a little bit earlier today. I should have saved up. I should have saved that for now. <laughs> yeah, that's on my short list. I'd really like to get a get a false water cobra in here. Yeah, I that, love their I love their attitude. I mean, you're carrying a venomous snake, but it, with no danger, mm -hmm. and they're they're then they're if you know because you know how to handle them, you, you never would have have a problem, right? She bit one person when she was, you know, how babies are bitey. When right. She was six weeks old. They were probing her to detect to determine her sex. Oh yeah. <laughs> Perfectly understandable. Oh, right? Yeah. Really, really good way to get bit. I would bite somebody under them circumstances, so I don't fault them one bit. <laughs> exactly. We had to do a special forces physical. I almost bit the doc. <laughs> I had to do two physicals for that. The first one, the PA that I had to go see was this really sweet, short black lady two inch long fingernails that was unpleasant and then the next mm -hmm. <laughs> the next physical i had to do <laughs> was by a former group doctor who was like six foot four and he had meat hooks like this so yeah i decided i don't care what happened i didn't want to do any more physicals after that i just die <laughs> <laughs> uh, tj was asking how this sri lankan's doing well i went to feed him again today and he's in blue so now we've got to hold off a little bit more but other than that he's doing fine i left him completely alone for a week i had a good handling session where um i took him out he didn't try to strike or anything like that uh, handled him for a while put him back in and i left him completely alone for a week and then i went back in to try and feed him earlier today and then I see his eyes are hazed over. So, and I did learn that when he's in blue, he's, he's going to strike again. <laughs> he was coming at me. Um, he was ready to kill me. So I just um, sprayed down his, ah, well, hello. This is an extreme reverse Okatee corn snake. Oh, wow. Uh, she, she is kind of like our, our logo. Uh -huh. For uh, my my wife wanted to start breeding snakes, so we we took a picture of her, and there's no way I'm going to be able to show you, but she has a right. a demon mask. Oh yeah, I seen this on her picture. head. Yeah, I seen the still <laughs> picture of that. That's really cool. Yeah, I was, I was quite fond of that. This is not something you're going to find in the wild. This this was bred. Right. Yeah, yeah, you can just barely kind of see it when he slows down. Yep. <laughs> So we got a couple of these, and they're they're different coloration, candy colored corn snakes. I call them my candy corns. Nice. Yeah, Such a we crazy have pattern. It is. It is, and she didn't get handled very much because I, I don't like I I'm afraid of holding little snakes. All right. I'm gonna drop them. I'm gonna lose them. They're gonna break. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it's like the first time holding a baby. It's a lot like that. Be on the news. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbass, drop idiot, the drop the child. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my wife wanted. She handed me a. Um, I can't remember what kind of snake. It was some kind of corn snake or something like. It was a tessera. It was a special morph, and it was neat. And yeah. she wanted me to take a picture of it, and it flinched in a weird way as she's passing from her hand to my hand, and like flipped right out of my hand. Oh, you man. know, and. And and the way that it fell, it just fell right into a position where it could scurry away. I mean, it took us a while to to, to find right. it again and get it back. And it was all my fault, you know. It just, and I'm just I'm as a result, I'm weird about yeah. holding. Give me a big old full size snake, something that's not going to disappear into the furniture in a half a second. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's like my so, rough scale green snakes back here, man. They're so frail and so fragile that I'm. And so flighty, too. As soon as I try and get them in my hands, man, all it is is just like the little inflatable guy at the car at the car yard. 
at the car lot. <laughs> and I think I had it flopping around. Exactly. <laughs> and when you when we're doing like a like a public thing, if you want to if we want to take a snake with us to a, a, a like a, a beer garden kind of thing, right. they have to be big. No, oh, yeah. Because because the smaller they are, the more shit they can hide in or get into. Mm -hmm. And 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 once they have their head into something, you're not pulling them out backwards. They don't have reverse. Nope. So <laughs> I, had, I had I had one of my ball pythons. I used to keep my curry up on my desk and I had the rack on the bottom. Yeah, you, know, you pull out, you keep the cups in. And I'd stop paying attention for two seconds and my ball python got all tied up inside the wires of the curry. And I had to uh I had to take it apart and just cut it out of there. <laughs> That's terrible. The day I got my Malaysian water monitor. The one that they told me not to underestimate. And I was right. like, oh, yeah, I won't. Yeah, I, I did. Over and over <laughs> again. So I'm driving it home with no enclosure. I don't, I don't even have it in a pillowcase. I'm just holding <laughs> this lizard as I'm driving. Oh and so as I'm going down the road, he decides to bolt and went up underneath or into the dashboard. Oh, no. Completely disappeared inside the dashboard. So that I had when I got home, I had to remove my dashboard. <laughs> Crazy. To get to this fucking thing. <laughs> yeah. Man. I, I I underestimated it over and over again. Just, um, I took some. I did take some. Let's see. Did take some pictures here. I was just kind of flipping through stuff on the other screen of my Nile monitor one time when he uh this was one time when he'd gotten away from me downstairs in the reptile room and I had to go. Wow. That's just from one time of having to go pick him up when he was all squirrely. And, and that's ju that's obviously clothes. just claws. Yeah, that's all claws. Yeah, <laughs> and I, my monitor would rake me every time I picked him up. He would musk me. I would do like the, he would fire his feces at distance. <laughs> it's amazing how good he was at that. <laughs> I wasn't that bad. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm really happy he doesn't do that to me because the last time I had to clean up after him, man, he made a mess. Yeah, that was one thing that was really tough about the time that he had gotten latched onto the back of my neck. Is as soon as I, as soon as I got him off of my neck, he ended up upside down with all four legs wrapped around my arm and refused to let go. I'm holding him over his bathtub, trying to get him to drop down into his water, and he just was hanging on for dear life and just gouged the back of my arm terribly. I finally got him back in, and it took me a good 30 minutes to get cleaned up after he got done slicing me to ribbons. I mean, you know, you got all these horror stories from him, but they are, he is so much fun to work with. <laughs> once he, uh, once he calms down. And he hasn't bitten me in like two years, but I'm still really hesitant to, uh, to let him get up on my shoulders or anything because I just don't want to risk. I don't want to risk him biting me in the face, getting another shot in my neck or trying to take my ear off or anything. For the longest time, these were my favorites. Nice. Yeah, I would, uh, wherever I lived, I was always be able to find these out in the mm -hmm. wood. This is a bull snake. Right. Uh, gopher snakes, bull snakes, same. They're, they're, uh, bull snake is a subspecies of gopher, for those that, that don't know. And... They are programmed to mimic rattlesnakes. They look mm -hmm. the part, they act the part, they make a sound by uh, whistling through their glottis that makes a sound right. like a rattlesnake. So it's a hiss, but it sounds like a rattle. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing in the wild is, of course, uh, we don't, we don't, we, oh, it's a rattlesnake and back away. If we think it's a rattlesnake, we kill it. Right. So. And it's, it's not a happy ending for all of these that are that are convincing yeah. mimics. It's a constant battle for me for the guys that are on my job. I've got I'll, I'll have two or three crews that I've got to bounce around, check on throughout the day. 
Mm-hmm. At least, at least once a month, somebody's talking about, well, I had to kill this copperhead. And it's like stud. You didn't have to kill anything. You know, <laughs> you don't. It, have- it's I. What I've seen is it copperheads result at zero point or point zero one percent of people bitten by copperheads have died for point zero one. Right. Yeah, yeah, they're nowhere near nowhere near what some of the other ones are. Give us a hiss. You're right next to the microphone. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> if I wanted to get somebody to hiss, my little hog nose down there, my female hog nose will hiss her ass off. Oh, yeah. I so, I want to yeah. be his friend. I I do, but he's always acted. He's acted like this since I got him when he was a yeah when he was a baby. It's just yeah. It's he's just he's, a he's holding attitude. his mouth open, holding that tongue out there. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate that he's always always going to be this way. Yeah. Just any handling at all, he doesn't want it. Mm. Which is too bad because I love him. He's beautiful. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a good looking animal. And they get yeah, pretty good it, size too. Seen some he's he's bulls. uh he's three foot ten. Uh and he's he's two, he just turned two. Hmm. So I'm expecting him to cap out at about six. Right. In another year or so. I'll put it <laughs> Yeah, my my next two that I want to get, I really want to get a false water cobra to work with because they're just gorgeous. And I want to get a female green anaconda and get a nice aquatic enclosure set up for her. But I've got to get more space before I do that. All right, well, since you mentioned it. <laughs> Go ahead, keep talking. Yeah. Talk to the you know the people on your chat. Yep, yep. Let's see. Do I have any snakes in bioactive? Laura was asking. I don't have any in bioactive right now. Um, I do have um like my green tree python i've got a lot of saturated moss in his enclosure it's not not bioactive um but that he perches a lot and that moss down there on the bottom holds uh uh holds humidity really well and they require a little bit more humidity um i've actually just put some moss in with the uh, sri lankan too because uh, i was having a hard time keeping the humidity up here but I do want to. I do want to start a couple of them bioactive uh, for the smaller animals. Um, I do have for my tagu downstairs. He's technically bioactive. You know, I've got soil in there really deep for her because she's a burrower. Uh, even when she's not brumating for a lot of a lot of time during the week, you know, she'll spend a day or two, something like that, completely burrowed in before she comes out and starts cruising around. So the bioactive stuff is just fine for her. Uh, but my bigger snakes, I still got them on paper. I'm not going to go bioactive with any of my retics or my berms, my larger ones, until I've got enough space to where I can give them like a 12 foot long, four or five foot deep enclosure um, where I've got some real space in there. And I can really, because I mean, if you, if you've just got them in an eight foot enclosure, you're going to have a really hard time getting a bioactive that's going to be able to maintain, it's going to be able to break down for, for that kind of a, that size of a snake. You're going to, you're going to, you got to have enough material to break it down or else you're just going to be going in and switching out and completely changing substrate and stuff all the time. But yeah, my on my larger snakes, my uh, large retakes and berms, I've just got paper in there for them right now. Using grow, I've seen people use grow tents. Um, yeah, you know, like I said, as long as you can keep the, uh, as long as you can keep the parameters right, and you can make sure that they don't escape, it'd be a lot easier to keep use grow tents 
on uh on some snakes than it is for lizards of course because lizard will claw right through it i wanted to pull out one of my falsies yeah but she's locked up in a log and obviously not wanting to come out i started to lift up his enclosure and he's freaking out back and away so he doesn't want to be yeah. handled either so i'll just i just leave them where they are i don't want to oh, yeah. i don't want to be forceful this you know what this is are you familiar with these mm, not right off the top of my head okay this is a dumerals boa is that dumerals oh, these, these are yeah these are one of the few old world boas mm-hmm uh, and this one is, you can see all these little masks, these right. tiki masks along the side. I refer to these as the souls of the damned. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dumerals, this is obviously a baby. Almost everything we have is babies. Right. Uh, and she will be six, eight feet long. She's going to be one of the stout bodied mm-hmm. boas. Right. Uh, and so she'll be impressive when she's, when she's big. And my wife just got me an Argentine boa oh, for nice. my birthday. So we'll be picking that up in a couple of weeks. Oh, cool. But uh, I, I quite like this one. I think this, this is a pretty good starter snake. It's not real difficult to keep. Right. Yeah. Not yeah. a lot of, but unfortunately they're not arboreal, they're fossorial. So mm. you'll never see the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Somebody just wanted to see the yeah. mask. Yeah. You see those masks? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. See, now when he gets big, you can say that's the souls of all the babies they've eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And one of the things my, my wife has pointed out, she's quite fond. She's decided that she's quite fond of boas. Right. Uh, they, they have more distinctive head shape. Mm. Than really any of the other snakes, they have they, they have a brow ridge and a, sometimes a little upturned. They have their 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 heads are shaped a little bit more like dogs' heads than than the other snakes are. Mm. I don't know how I can show that they how they have up upturned brow. But she's quite nice to handle. Yeah, and it's going to be a couple of years of couple of years before we can breed this. We do have a male for them, but they're both babies. Right. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper to get the babies. So that's that's what we've been doing. And and it's right. it's not that we want to dive into breeding. We want to raise them so that we we know that they're taken care of the right way. Right. When we get to that age, we know more what we're dealing with. We were right. uncertain about the um the red not the, the Dominican red mountain bows that I had out earlier today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we were told that both of them had bitten their owners. Really, uh, but in further investigation, because they're both full grown, they're both they're breed ready. Uh, but the thing is, is that both of those were feed responses. Yeah, to be blamed on the owner. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I could you, go down there. Yeah, I could go down there and get a food response by from any one of my snakes right now if I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could take out one of the falsies, but that they, neither one of them wants to come out right now, and I oh, don't want yeah. to be abusive about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the same way with mine. I'd get my little retic out, but he just ate. My other two big ones just ate. My boa in the other room is in shed. My green tree python just ate. So Mr. Yeah, is in shed, and I've stressed him out enough already. I built uh, a lot of it, not all of them. The, 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 there's a bunch of wooden ones you can see stacked, the brown ones. Right. Okay, th- those we bought. Somebody else built those, and they're not the way I would have built them. Right. The, the two eight-footers below, I built both of those. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a, a stack of six, or you know, excuse me, a stack of five six-foot mm-hmm. ones that look cool. like this. With the sliding glass door, I'm going to be, as soon as we get off of this, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be going to uh, the, the Home Improvement Depot to pick yeah. up the materials for that. Cool. I have the, the plastic for the windows already set up. It's just a matter of buying the plywood and assembling. Right. And, and uh, I've, I've learned a lot in woodworking from this. And you can't see it here. Yep. So I'm going to change the camera angle. You see that there? Uh-huh. I built that. Oh, cool. 
yeah, that was also another learning project. So the, the idea was that each one of those three levels is two apartments. And when you flip up the center divider, you can pull out the divisor between the rooms. Right. And then you know, it would just be, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an easy way of just introducing one snake to the other. Just, hey, it's now one six foot room instead of two three foot rooms. <laughs> right. It comes in handy too if you get a lot of snakes at a young age, you know. Where you've automatically got access to bigger enclosures for them. I thought it was a fine experiment, but it's not, it wasn't a good idea, really. I, I want to have separate enclosures mm. that I can, you know, remove and stack in different ways as needed. Right. Uh, that just, that is too big and awkward. Well, it's got wheels. It, you did that part. Yes. I didn't put wheels <laughs> on any of the melamine enclosures that I built. <laughs> And you should have seen me trying to move them into my previous house into this house. <laughs> yeah, my my stack of five that I'm about to do. The reason it's going to be five is because that's floor to ceiling. That's as much space as I've got. Right. I can put on a on a pallet that has wheels at the bottom, of course. So all of it together, each each one of the enclosures is going to be 17 inches high. Mm -hmm. um, so 16 inch high inside. Um, right. And then they're all in a pallet of wheels, and then I'll have just a couple of inches between the top one and the roof. Right. And this is this is the most efficient way I can make it out of these sheets of wood because you know uh, one sheet of four forty eight inches divided by three sixteen mm -hmm. inches most efficient way to do that. Right. These these big ones on the bottom they're eighteen inches high and thirty inches deep, which again mm -hmm. forty eight inches. Take out 18, you've got 30 yeah. left. And yeah. so that was the optimum amount of space there. Oh, by the way, another one of the expenses on that was that each of those, each of those enclosures on the bottom have, you can't see them, but they're big handles that are screwed into uh into the, the frame. Oh yeah. That you can so you, somebody on either side can pick them up and walk with the thing. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's cool. It's a good thing to put on. How big are your enclosures? Same, eight by thirty. Okay. Yeah. Did you build um, those yourself? Yeah, I built. Oh, uh, I, I've got. I built mine out of melamine, um, which is really good to use if you do it right. It's a. It's a still a particle board, um, but if you're if you're able to protect that melamine coating that goes on the inside of it, then it's really durable. Really good stuff. Um, extremely heavy. Um, so I've got I've got a four foot, a six foot, and two eight foot melamine enclosures that I built myself. My um, wife wants me to use that, and I'm like, "That's too damned heavy for the for the assemblage that we have behind me." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude, my six foot melamine enclosure that I've got back there that I've got my tegu in right now it's a two level. Um, it, it about blows my back out just trying to move that thing. It's like when I moved from the other house, I had a two eight foot enclosures that I had built into the room. And there was not enough room for me to maneuver it into the hallway. So I had to take the window out, push it through the window out into the front yard <laughs> in order to load the thing up on the truck. <sighs> so I, I don't know, man. I, I really want to buy a house that's going to be big enough for me to go ahead and set up the way I want to where I don't have to move it. So I'm hesitant to start building a whole lot of new stuff. Um, I mean, I even built that eight by eight by six for the Nile monitor and I just couldn't avoid that. He had to have that space. So <sighs> I, I was, uh, I was excited uh, that, mm -hmm. that, that I might, that would be able to use my garage for a lot of the storage space, but then we moved yeah. somebody into the garage. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier to move into the garage than it was to move. Yeah. We, the we made the, the garage into an apartment and that was like, Mm -hmm. Well, damn it. I really needed that space. <laughs> All right. We're sitting on 60 snakes at the moment. <laughs> Man. Are you really You're sitting at 60 right now? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, well, three of them have yet, two or three of them have yet to arrive. Right. But, oh, cool. and I know that some, and we don't, we have a lot of them that are in tubs because some of them kind of need to be. I mean, the, right. The, the rainbow boas mm -hmm. have such a ridiculous humidity requirement. Mm -hmm. You can't really manage it anything else. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the Dominican red mountain boas, both of them are sharing. Uh, one of them is inside of a tub. The other one that I was holding earlier today that kind of lives on top of that one. Mm -hmm. But they both live in a grow tent. Okay. Oh, cool. Somebody, up was, just, yeah, somebody was just asking about that earlier. It does maintain the humidity. I mean, you can tell. <laughs> somehow. Okay. Somehow my, uh... there we go. <laughs> went over to turn the fan off and my uh my webcam shut off too so okay yeah i love it the old man technology thing but yeah somebody was asking about the grow tents earlier and I, it, I, it does maintain the humidity if you have yeah. a high high humidity requirements I, I i can recommend it that the grow tents work yeah i've, I've seen people try them with lizards i i don't know that yeah I no somebody somebody says go pvc i want to hmm but there's a cost issue. Yeah. Yeah, you well, guys that prepared to drop is... thousands and thousands of dollars on PVC enclosures. And it's... It is cost prohibitive for me to mm -hmm. go to PVC. I just don't have a choice. Yep. Yep. If I, if I ever manage to get the channel built up and get the Patreon built up and all that stuff to where it can support everything like that, then... I'll take it as far as the community wants me to, but I can only finance so much of it. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a there's there's a thing that there's there's enclosures that I can buy that are of a quality I can't duplicate. I can't build okay. enclosures this good. Yeah, you know that that are that are made out of uh, PVC and like steel corners, mm -hmm. like vertical co corner columns, and then there's just like sheets of PVC that fit into these. I, right. I would love to be able to make them like it's super lightweight and they're really efficient yeah. and um, they don't hold humidity real well because they have, they have mesh on the top. But what I've done with that is I, I, I put a uh, uh, closed cell foam strips of yeah. closed cell foam on the top. And so that, that seals in the humidity that way. The, the, the problem is those are uh, four by four by two hmm. and those eight footers back there with the handles, with the paint, with the polyurethane water treatment, with the wheels, all that. Mm -hmm. I built those for roughly $300 each. Yeah. Maybe, maybe three twenty five dollars each. Mm -hmm. Buy one, buy an eight foot by 30 inch yep. enclosure yeah. somewhere. I think my PVC You're looking is at like 800, 900 bucks or something like that. Yeah, no. So the, the thing that I've got behind me, if I was going to buy that from somebody else, there's going to that's going to be fifteen hundred dollars, hmm. as opposed to the three hundred I spent building it. Right. Now, if you want to do PVC, I wanted to do something like this cabinet over here where I've got multi level, right? So I wanted to do four levels. I was going to do something like that, but hmm. out of PVC, and the materials alone, five thousand hmm. dollars. Up to for yeah. four enclosures. <laughs> right. So I take this, what's behind me. If I wanted to do four levels high, now I'm like three, six, nine, twelve. I'd be tw paying twelve hundred dollars for the four level enclosure. Five thousand for the same thing? Yeah, That's some crazy. of these some of these setups people have, man. There it the dollars just rack up so quickly. Yeah, that's that's indeed. It's the thing, man. You might get a, you might get a hundred foot snake, and then or a hundred dollar snake rather, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> going into Titanic yeah. now. But yeah, a hundred dollar snake, and I mean it end up costing you a couple grand. Easy, easy. Just just in an enclosure, which is just mm -hmm. crazy. That's yeah. I mean the melamine, that stuff's great to work with once you once you get everything done and it's in place and whatnot and it's cheap i think it was like 35 bucks for a four by eight sheet um two sheets on that enclosure and the door like the doors on one of my eight footers came off of an aquarium just the four foot tempered side panels off of an aquarium then i stripped the silicone off of them used them for doors so that was free and then 150 160 bucks or something like that for the radiant heat panel yeah, I, I really wanted to do. My wife wanted me to. She's been urging me 
not to make these out of wood. She said, you know, make them out of PVC. That's what all the pros are doing. Well, you know, yeah, the people with buckets of ducats are doing that. Right. <laughs> I mean, these, I don't have <laughs> these, these melamine enclosures that I've got, they've lasted me years. Yeah. They've, I, I've had a couple basking platforms that were raw around the edges that have kind of deteriorated. I've had to trim off, but as far as the rest of them structurally, man, they're still good. Like I said, that melamine will last forever. As long as you don't gouge it and let that water penetrate down into the, down into the wood. Then that stuff I've, I've run, you know, every week I'm running scrapers over it and cleaning it and stuff like that. I'm seeing somebody in the chat minute rice um, went, we, we, we took our snakes out to a pub. And we, and we met this guy at the pub and we, we had my BCI, my seven foot BCI out there with us. And right. this guy, Minute Rice comes and meets us and he'd never, he'd never had a snake, but fell in love with my BCI. Nice. And so we showed him how to look these up, search for, you know, morph market or whatever. And a couple weeks later, he's got a BCI. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're going to show him how to how to build these. <laughs> yep. you're going to you're going to need one that big. <laughs> I keep yeah, I keep telling every you know everybody talking about how they hate snakes and all this other stuff. I've got one guy, an African guy at work, keeps talking about how terrified he is of snakes. It's like I'm, it's like I'm going to introduce you to him, and you're going to end up owning one before we yep. park rails. <laughs> I got to tell you when when I when I got together with my wife. She was very aphidophobic. Uh, yeah. So I had, uh, I had a gopher snake and I had my daughter's uh, ball python. We had another, we had a tomalipin rat snake also previous to that. that, that um, but I, we didn't have like, a huge collection of snakes. I had a couple of snakes. And my wife was terrified. Mm -hmm. And so we were somewhere out in the Midwest a little over a year ago. And it's at dusk, and she saw a snake in the grass. And she freaked out, jumped up on the stoop and screamed. <laughs> and um, we were we we're all trying to console her. So like, you know, we're in we're in the middle of the city. You know, this isn't gonna be a rat. I mean, this isn't gonna be a rattlesnake. Right. You know, I mean, whatever the whatever that was, it was it was a milk snake, corn snake, um, gopher snake, garter snake. Right. You know, don't, whatever it is, it's it's pretty, and it's harmless, because you know, venomous snakes don't get well established in the city. They tend to be isolated pretty quickly. Yeah. So, um, a couple weeks later, I think I think that that moment embarrassed her, and and I, I think she just decided to that she wasn't going to be phobic anymore, mm -hmm. and she she hit that head on. So she showed up. She showed up at the house with a, uh, I think it was a ghost morph um, corn snake. Yeah, she just went out and bought one. Nice. Like, <laughs> like, how did you do that? I, I could I could not hand her my gopher snake. I couldn't hand her the ball python. I mean, she would just she would just be trembling if I tried to get her to hold one of these. You know, just terrified. Wow. But then she comes home with this, and she she says, "Yeah, I'm still scared." But I'm not going to be much longer. Nice. I'm not, putting, I'm not putting up with this any longer. So I mean, kudos to that. Can you imagine having a fear of heights and then deciding to go skydiving? Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's the way I've approached everything in my life. That's that I've and I try and be empathetic with people, but I just can't. If you, I I can't relate to having a fear of something that you're not willing to overcome it, it's uh, i tried i was I tried impressed to with her it, but <clears throat> yeah so she came home she came home with that uh, with that cone snake and she says oh there's another one i want you to see and by see she means pay for <laughs> so <laughs> of course <laughs> so same day we end up with a california king nice again beautiful snake and and she loved them and, and she really does love them and she's gotten these snakes where they 
they're equally fond of her. She had that corn snake next to her for months mm -hmm. and it'll surf the glass and want to be held. Yeah. And this is another thing that people don't understand. A lot of these snakes want to come out. Mm -hmm. They want to be held. They want to interact. Yep. It's not part of their evolution necessarily, but you know, I mean, look at, look at how plastic life is. You know, you put it in a certain, in a different situation, these animals are adaptable. Mm -hmm. They, if they know they're not being threatened, they know they're not in harm. They, they don't, they don't feel trapped. They want to be handled. And when you put, get them, when you back to the, when you, when you bring them back to the cage, they recognize the familiar smell and setup, and they, they slither right out of your hand and they're back home. Mm -hmm. And that's how they look at it. Yeah. So we, we started accruing, a you know, a few more. And uh, she started, she, she let me reinvest in some for myself. Cause I have, most of these are hers, but uh, I, I have a few that are, that are mine, that are my pets. Mm -hmm. And so she came up with the idea that she wants to start breeding them. And she's done a, a, so much research. She learned more about snakes in six months than I knew in my life. Really? Yeah. And I'm, awesome. and she's just, she's, just, she's on top of it. So now she has, she has conversations with breeders and I feel like the, the ignorant twit on the outside. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can relate to that because my, <laughs> my forte has always been handling. It's been working with, with the minds of the big animals and I've never mm -hmm. bred. I, I've never really studied the morphs and all the different genetics and so forth. So, you know, and I've got people asking me all the time, you know, sending me pictures. What do you think this is? Be like, you know what? I've got a breeder friend of mine that is going to be able to tell you what that is. I'm not even going to start telling because I don't want somebody going out there and saying, well, Tim said this is what it is. And then everybody. Are you talking about identifying them. morphs? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I can tell you species pretty well. But when you show yeah. me two or three ball pythons and ask me what I don't. I, yeah, I have to exactly. show up to my wife. <laughs> and, and they keep in like ball pythons are terrible, man. They they come up with a new morph every week. Yeah, and indeed. Uh, yeah, it breeds yeah. so many of them. That I got a friend who who coincidentally got into the snake thing at the same time as we did, completely independently of us. So mm -hmm. we run into our friends at a herp convention, and we're like, "You're into this too?" It was it was weird how we both got into it at the same time. Right. But, you know, he, what that, and if for anybody that's curious, this is Matt Dillahunty, because yeah. some of the people watching this will know who I'm talking about. Right. Um, but he, he was, he remembers a time when there was only three ball mm -hmm. python morphs in existence. Right. And there's, now there's, you know, the, look at the variety. Yeah. It's amazing it's how plastic, it's amazing how plastic, you know, life can be. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that was actually the um, the first time I realized that um, you guys were in the in the reptiles was um, you, you and Matt had done a just snakes um, episode of, and I can't remember which channel it was because I know there's like three or four different ones that you guys are on, but uh, one of them was just an all snakes thing with you and Matt, and uh, I was like, oh shit, well that's cool, and uh, so I started following you know because Matt's putting out the stuff on his channel. A lot of times when he does egg cuttings and stuff like that, you know, <clears throat> him yeah, he's putting that stuff out. He's gone well beyond what we can do. Uh, he has, uh, he did the thing where he's raising the rats. So he's ra yeah. raising his own feeder rats and that, and he does the frozen thought. So that means that he has to have a death chamber, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the carbon dioxide death chamber and all of that. Yeah. And my wife, kudos to her she tr <laughs> she tried to build one and just couldn't do it <laughs> she she had to move one of it there was one ball python that it, it was not taking frozen thought it, it would only eat live and so she's right. trying she's like scenting it and everything but she's trying all these different tricks but right. the python will not take frozen thought. You can't fool it. It it has to be alive and moving. It has a different smell. No, fuck that. It has to be exactly this. And so the snake, as the snake gets bigger, she and she's still trying, still mm. trying to get everything on frozen thought. But then this one is just holding out. Right. So she just it, it's it's at a point where she can't keep giving it the pinkies. Mm -hmm. She's got to move to a fuzzy. And what's the difference between a fuzzy and a pinky? Well, a fuzzy 
is fuzzy. <laughs> and fuzzy rats, unlike pinkies, fuzzy rats are cute. <laughs> and my wife was unable <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> to present this. So she ends, she ends up going out and buying kitten formula and putting it on her knuckle and holding it so that the, 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 so that the rat will lick the kitten formula. She nursed this thing to the point that its eyes are open. It lives here. Oh, man. It has a great big old cage. It's a pet. That We've got five pet rats now. You, you, you spend enough time with... <laughs> You spend enough time yep. thaw thawing rats and then with somebody coming over your shoulder going, oh, that one's so cute. Oh, you know, and they're frozen, of course, but they're still cute. Eventually, yep. you're going to end up having pet rats. So now we've got three male and two female pet rats in separate cages. And they get and when you do fondled or yep. messed with just the same as a prairie dogs and a dog and everybody else. They are, they are better pets than snakes. They're smart, they're, they're affectionate, they're loving, they're they're that they'll play games, they they laugh. Rats laugh when you tickle them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just all of that. So you, you won't be able to hear it because human ears can't pick this up, but other recording devices have. Right. And you won't know what it is if you hear it in real time. But if you slow the recording down, that's a laugh. Really? That's that's the tricky <laughs> thing. I, mean, I know they will I know they will do something with their teeth when they're content. It's almost it's their yeah. way of purring, you know. You'll you'll yeah. have them over there yeah. and they'll start doing this thing with their teeth. So if you if you're gonna have 60 fucking snakes, and if, if you're gonna be a professional breeder, you've got to go down that path of raising your own rats and that means all the work that goes into that because we can go away for a week mm -hmm. and the snakes be fine mm -hmm. you can't do that when you've got the rats right you need daily attention you know you have cleaning and feeding and all and just it, it's it's daily yeah. work routine it saves you a shit ton of money so we've just we've just decided that we're never gonna be yeah I'm not. Yeah. I'm not gonna breed. I don't want to breed any feeders. Not unless I get to the point to where I can, I can work from home and be home all the time and have people around me that I can trust to take care of things when I leave. So it's. Yeah. I'm already locked to my house now as it is. You know, I'm good to go away for a couple of days at a time. But Ruth can't take care of the two 16 foot snakes and a six foot Nile monitor if something goes wrong. You know if. For some reason, one of the snakes gets out of the enclosure. She can go yeah. down there and ask it politely to just go into the tub <laughs> until I get home. <laughs> She's not going to wrestle that animal around. <laughs> I'd be pulling up the surveillance cameras and watching her going, okay, now get in a box. <laughs> yeah, we got to figure out what we're going to do if we ever go back to traveling like we used to. Yeah, because we would frequently we would be out of the house for a week. Mm -hmm. You know, we would go to to Europe or or you know Australia or something like that. I mean, we I've been to Australia twice. I've been to like twenty two countries. I was recently invited to go to Belgium to to yeah. do a debate there, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm down with that. The, the problem was that the the university that invited me to do that hadn't first checked how much it costs to fly across the Atlantic. <laughs> probably something they should have looked into <laughs> before, <laughs> before right. making the invitation yeah because i mean they, when you're when you're in europe flights are stupid cheap mm -hmm. we we got from from london to paris for 40 bucks and then i went from paris to rome for 21 dollars. really wow so if you're in Europe, yeah, everything's well. And I'm sure that these these guys would that's that's everybody that they've had over has been from somewhere in Europe, and that's the way that they look at things. Right. But crossing the Atlantic, well, no, now it's eighteen hundred. Really? So yeah. So I'd stow away on a cargo ship. <laughs> <laughs> I have gotten I've gotten across the Atlantic pretty cheap a couple of times. I would uh if I if I wanted to get to London, um I would look at, at 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 areas around there, you know, like like how much would it cost to get to Glasgow or right. you know, 
or Dublin or something like that. So, I mean, I was supposed to go to London. It was going to be $1,800. But if I went to Dublin, that's seven. Mm -hmm. Well, on this particular day, if I go with this particular time, I can go for $700. Well, that's, you know, look at that. That's what almost a, it, just a little over a third as much. So mm -hmm. let's, let's do that. Right. Uh, one time I, I brag about this all the time. I, that, that there was this one, there was an airline that doesn't exist anymore uh, called wow airlines. That if you, if I went on a particular Monday, then if I flew from Boston to Reykjavik, it would be $110. Damn. I can't fly from Dallas to Reykjavik because that's 1800, mm -hmm. but I can fly from Dallas to Boston Right. For 110. That's so great. then you cross the street from the, the, the domestic to the international airport, go through security again, and now take your international flight. And then once you're in Reykjavik, the flight from there to Glasgow, 35 bucks. <laughs> nice. I got my whole family across the Atlantic for $250 each. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> See, it was free. Well, normally, me, last time normally I went, but that was on Uncle Sam. So. Normally it's more than three times that, you know, so, so that's what, that's, that's why they couldn't have me over there. But I have been a couple of times. I've had the good fortune that uh, I've been able to, I have been for, for until COVID mm -hmm. changed everything for everybody. Right. I had been uh, at least a half a dozen years. I had been to London twice a year, every year. Oh, wow. And of course with London, you know, there's, there's you know, Manchester or mm -hmm. shut up dog <laughs> <laughs> somebody commented in your chat earlier that my dogs usually uh, are in interrupt everything and they've been good really good right they've now. actually been really good so far yeah yeah so far i think it's only been All twice right. they've tried to interrupt yeah and we have been on for quite a while so i'm gonna have to bail here shortly oh yeah yeah it has what is it five wow yeah it has been a hot minute hasn't it yeah that's why what Ruth was asking me earlier. She's like, "You got the, you got like a list of questions or anything?" I'm like, "No, we did this. It's dream of consciousness, and before you know it, two hours is going to be gone." And <laughs> so. yeah, I, I do want to thank you for having me on, though. This was a nice change of pace. Oh yeah, where there's there's not you know debating or anything where where I don't have to talk about the same old shit all the time. Right. Um, it, it was nice to talk about this instead and oh, yeah. share these kind of stories. I don't have a lot of them. So this is what, this isn't something I'd be able to do often. Hey, but I do appreciate this, mo this one moment. Yeah. Well, we'll do, um, I'd like to start doing like some other group stuff and all that stuff too, you know, with getting some other people in and all that. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do it again at some point. Um, Matter of fact, Kagan's been on before, and I, we've her and I have been talking about getting back on here again. I'd like to kind of do an open Zoom call at some point. I think think um, at some point I'll start doing maybe a weekly or biweekly open Zoom call where people can just jump in and talk snakes and stuff like that. Sounds fun. This is yeah. This has been this has been really cool because I, I knew this was going to be a nice change of pace for you. Like I said, it's it's it's. <laughs> it's nice not to have to tell people that snakes don't talk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to let this boxer out before his bladder blows. All right, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming on, man. It was great to have you. Great to talk with you. We'll definitely Thank you, do it you again. too, sir. We'll do it again soon. All right. Good night, my... Bye-bye.